Hello everyone, it's Connor again. Today is not my usual video, as this is not me making a video essay or an interview with another content creator. Instead, this is a mirror of a video I was in with the Mustache Mafia channel, more commonly known as Bob, who allowed me to go on his panel to discuss 2021 in review, along with several other content creators who you should also check out. The full video is available on this channel as well as theirs. I highly recommend you subscribe to their channel, as well as their podcast and other works. If you really enjoyed this video, consider going to check out the other guests' content as well, as they were wonderful to talk to, and I look forward to discussing politics and all further issues with parents channels like this in the future. Thanks again for watching and I hope you enjoy the rest of this video. Welcome ladies, gentlemen, bros, broettes, bro fluids and non-bronary people to the Mustache Mafia podcast. I'm Mustache Bob, your host. Uh, I would say erstwhile but I haven't been doing enough uh, content lately but uh, today I'm joined by the progressive American BZ Douglas poet and playwright Brenton Langle, whose intro I just kind of tanked on purpose, and, and Contraband. Uh, we're going to do a 2021 uh, year review, and I've got a little bit of echo in my headphones, uh, but we're going to discuss uh, local issues, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, its cultural and economic impacts, the January 6th riot and its aftermath, Joe Biden's first year as president, and the end of the Afghan war. And then we're going to conclude with some positive things that we can do to make 2022 a better year than 2020 and 2021. But first, I'm going to allow my erstwhile guests to introduce themselves in order that you're going to see them on screen. So I'm going to throw it to the Progressive American first. Hey, Bob, thanks for having me on. Uh, as Bob mentioned, I'm the Progressive American. My name's Connor Kelly. I host the uh, aptly named channel, YouTube, and uh, podcast, as well as a newsletter that is trying to get off the ground. Uh, I'm a student of political science and history from Loris College. I recently graduated and a former staffer with the Elizabeth Warren campaign. And I am perpetually annoyed by Twitter at some, at some times. <laughs> it's an addiction we all have to quit at some point. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me on, and I look forward to discussing this with you. All right, fire, f fire free, uh, BZ Douglas. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, I'm BZ Douglas. I'm uh, an independent journalist based in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I'm covering uh, police abuse, uh, systemic um, issues with the criminal justice system, political corruption. And um, I also uh, have a uh, documentary series out called State of Injustice, which you can find at stateofinjustice.com. And it's also on the Real News Network. And I'm really, really excited to be here, Bob. Uh, I might have to bow out to take a call around five o'clock, but I'm hoping to jump back in. So uh, really looking forward to getting through the year. This is quite a thing to prepare for as a discussion. <laughs> it is a bit of a big subject. Thank you for coming on, though. All right, Brent, to you. Yeah, you should have done what I did. Don't do any preparation whatsoever. <laughs> he's, he's just winging it. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm used to it. Uh, okay. So, hi, uh, I'm Brenton Lengel. Um, you guys may remember me from uh, Bobby B being on uh, my channel, uh, which is an extension to the YouTube channel. Just search my name, Brenton Lengel. Uh, the show is Insurrection with Brenton Lengel, uh, which is a uh, continuation of of the radio show that I did. Uh, I'm also a poet, playwright, and Ringo-nominated comic creator of Snow White Zombie Apocalypse and Daruti Shadow of the People. Um, Bobby and me have been going through chapter by chapter Homage to Catalonia, which is one of the best books in the world uh, and a big major influence on me. And uh, also um, BZ Douglas and I know each other from the New York underground open mic scene. And we were both very active on the ground and occu with Occupy Wall Street. Um, I was actually arrested once uh, and won. Thank you guys very much for that. Um, behind me, as you can see, uh, I have certain opinions. I, I am an, I'm, I am a classical anarchist in the Kaprotkinite tradition. And uh, yeah, other than that, I love to do debates against weirdo right-wingers. Uh, everyone from David, Dr. David D. Friedman to most recently Stefan Molyneux, who stormed out of the debate after I offered to, to mail him some eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made sure to tell him that the chicken that laid the eggs was white because I knew how important that was to <laughs> Stefan Molyneux. <laughs> oh, God. I guess that's a nice little segue into me. Um, 
My name is Contraband, everybody. Uh, Will is my actual name, but I go by Contraband, creator of the Contraband Wagon, where we're changing the conversation on race. I have two-hour live conversations with random people about the subject of race. Anyone can apply. Anyone can come on and have a conversation with me about it. Um, it actually spawned from a racism discussion group that I created in my local area. And once the pandemic hit and we went virtual, I just decided to open it up to everyone. And we've talked to people from all over the world, from all walks of life. Um, there are, uh, I've done over a hundred hours of conversation on race. You can view clips of these conversations on my YouTube channel of the same name, The Contraband Wagon. And um, if you're interested in talking about race with me, but you don't want to be on the live stream, we also do a round robin discussion on race with 10 people or less once a month. You can sign up there at www.meetup.com slash racism discussion group if you'd like to talk. Thanks for having me, Bob. Hey, thanks for coming on again, everybody. Uh, these guys, if you somehow are familiar with me, but not these fine gentlemen in the round table, please subscribe and like their content. If you're coming from their audience and you're just meeting me for the first time, please tune in to hear the dulcet sounds of my voice discuss various different issues in philosophy from a left-wing perspective. Mm -hmm. um, to start off our discussion, uh, we're going to start off at the local level. Um, this makes sense both because BZ's got to hop off and because... Uh, everything kind of does start at the local level. Uh, so I guess I'll lead off a little bit uh, talking about where I'm from and what the pressing local issues are in my life right now. Uh, I live in central Florida in the Daytona Beach area. Uh, we have what you would call a NASCAR and sunshine economy down here. Uh, there's very little middle class and uh, very little uh, political influence of the working people in this town. Uh, our, our influences are primarily dictated by the tourism industry and NASCAR explicitly. So what I've been doing over the last uh, couple of years down here is trying to get our voter registration up. Uh, I've been going around. I've actually knocked on doors during a pandemic, which was not probably the most intelligent thing to do in the world, uh, especially in a gun state like Florida. But um, I did it. And uh, uh, we, we actually uh, registered uh, about like 150 voters between 30 people over the last uh, two years, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you realize that our, our voter turnout in my area is about 45%, every little bit helps. Uh, we also are dealing with, in my area, um, something that's kind of happening across the country where um, homelessness and poverty are kind of being criminalized where I live. Uh, we've criminalized panhandling in my area, and we've done it in such a draconian way that if you actually give somebody who's panhandling money uh, not only is the person who's panhandling arrested and sent to jail or a, a homeless camp that the sheriff has built, uh, the uh, person who's giving the person money is fined a thousand dollars. So we've been trying to work to decriminalize panhandling here too. Uh, I've also been trying to work with my local DNC uh, chapter, which has been the most frustrating experience of my entire <laughs> life. Uh, which I, I, I'm sure anyone who's Poor ever worked bastard. with Democratic Party, yeah. Uh, I, I was told to my face that the way to win national elections was to buy radio and TV ads. And I responded with an off-color remark and BZ, Douglas, Brenton Langle, and Connor all facepalmed at the same time when I said that. <laughs> uh, so you know, you know it's messed up. Uh, but that's, that's the local, uh, those are the local issues where I'm at. Uh, should I throw to you, BZ, or does anybody else want to? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, it was, I, I, I said I wanted to talk about this, <clears throat> and it, it, I feel like it'll. It's a kind of nice thing with you know. You said at the end of this discussion when we were in the green room about like we're going to talk about what can we do in 2022, and I'm a big uh, evangelist of yeah local action. And what you were saying about like oh we only registered this many people, but when you look at how many voters there are, and the fact they're new voters, and hopefully it reengages them in the process, whereas they not, might not have been. Your ROI on effort put into local elections is so much bigger. When you just look at like the turnout, and um, so you know, here in Cleveland, I think um, some important things happened for us. With um, we elected a new mayor who's very much um, I, a lot of people agree with, like that he's analogous to like our city's Obama moment in terms of. He upset the political order. Not that he's like, you know, it's not it's not um, a new thing for a black man to be mayor in this town. But 
uh, when it came down to the election of him and his opponent, his opponent is very much part of the machine here. He was like the previous city council president. And so um, there's a lot of hope invested in him. But as a local journalist, I'm real interested in paying real close attention because, it, you know, I see a lot of the same things as where he's hiring a lot of the same people into things. You know, he brought on the same public safety director and that's the kind of change that we really needed to happen in this city was new blood at the top of at, at those types of positions. So I'm a big evangelist on, on local and um, my my year has been um, January 5th. You know, everyone's focused on like January 6th. But for me, January 5th, um, my head immediately went into the killing of a young man here in Cleveland named Vincent Belmonte. And he um, he was shot by a police officer that I had produced a lengthy report on back in um, October that made a pretty clear case like this guy shouldn't be on the force at all. And then not two months later, he uh, he killed a young man in that investigation for like, you know, our, you know, to bubble up through the system for there to be an internal investigation. It took about a year and they overlooked very important things that I highlighted in my reporting um, so I found a lot of, and the, the one thing I would hope to get out to like, you know, any content creators too, is like throw a little love towards any local organizers there. Like as a journalist, what I've keep finding is amazing people doing amazing work. They don't know a damn thing about much more than like, they can post something on Facebook. They're not on Twitter at all. Their YouTube is haphazard. So it's like finding those local people and amplifying them while yeah, I'm, I'm trying to make it as a full-time journalist and carve out a path for myself. I don't see any reason why anyone who has any expertise in producing content couldn't be doing that. So to me, it's, it's like the ultimate form of praxis that I'm really like, there's so much power and love that needs to be put on the local level. And that's where all these awful things at the national level fall down and hit the road and you can really see them in act. You, you know, it, it, I don't mean to talk over the rest of you guys, but the interesting thing happened to me like um, over the last couple of years where in about like 2007 I, I, I was forced to read for college this book called Bowling Alone uh, by John Putnam. I, I'm guessing Connor you're probably familiar with this. Uh, it really makes like political science professors weak in the knees and <laughs> one of the things he was talking about was kind of like the atomization of American society where people are like withdrawing from like local socialization well, hence the title of the book like people are going bowling alone and the bowling league is kind of declining. And at the time I read that, I thought that like he was wrong and that the internet would give you like a better sense of community. Like I was thinking like, well, if you're listening to a podcast in your ears as you're walking between classes, you're part of a bigger community than you would be if you're just in like in a bowling league. But like the last couple of years especially have completely changed my mind on that because you're right, the the big content creation and like uh, watching like a million subscriber YouTube channel or watching like cable television or listening to a podcast, even though you should definitely listen to mine all the time and like <laughs> and subscribe, um, uh, is not a substitute for actual like local interaction with, with people. And that's why I really like what you're doing with your journalism is like you're, you're, you're focusing on the issues that are happening in your area instead of just having like, national stories dominate your local news and I, I hope to make like take a local thing and then say like look this connects to a national thing mm -hmm. um and the big other thing that in local like news of the year besides our mayor is we passed something called issue 24 and this is a perfect example of what i'm saying is so we established in cleveland we had the consent decree imposed on the police department um for you know all the all the awful shit that's going on you know going back like tamir rice and has continued to go on and the uh the consent decree is like basically the federal government comes in and plays babysitter to our police departments and set up these bodies that they have to that have to give reports and, and pay attention but uh it can just go away and so issue 24 established a permanent police oversight body um and what was interesting about like the the nature of the um the the legislation is it required the demographics to be a certain type, like someone has to have had experience in mental health crises and someone has to have had experience dealing with uh, our incarceration. I don't have all the, like the, the thing I got to, I want to track it more and have all those details, but it's the kind of like local effort 
that if it works, I would hope to see it propagated. And I'd like to just jump in there if it's all right uh, and to add to that. Uh, a lot of that uh, nationalization of politics has, in my opinion, been exacerbated by the internet, particularly because when you watch, say, a channel like Sean and Jen or Three Arrows, who are some of the more well-known or or any of those, they're doing good work. They're making good educational content, but at the same time, they're responding to the commentary created by right-wingers who are specifically focused on culture war um, nationalistic content. And I, I recently graduated, so I'm still technically a baby political scientist, but hmm. one of the things that I learned is you can listen to them all you like and understand and respond to that content creation, but it, it takes – a actual some effort to show up to an indivisible meeting in your county it takes mm -hmm. it takes a desire to learn to realize hey your local newspapers aren't really talking about what the city council meeting is doing they're talking about like a murder that occurred two weeks ago that is not surprising at all and one of the things that i've learned and i don't want to out my location is too much because i have family out here who are not political yeah. but one of the things that i've learned is that you can Listen to all that all you like, but it won't change much when the Proud Boys show up at your your, uh, your nearby city at a school board. And that's what happened in Downers Grove recently. There was an attempt by the Proud Boys to remove an LGBTQ-friendly book that was supposed to help LGBTQ youth deal with uh, their development in puberty. And it was, it was a personal story, and people used that as a means to say this county is involved in pedophilia or things like that. And that is an extension of the National Proud Boys movement, something that started with really online media but developed into a local issue. And if you aren't aware of that happening in your community, the Proud Boys and other movements like that become some distant thing you see on your screen even when they're right outside your window. So I think – I think that kind of work, that kind of commentary, and that kind of analysis is needed now more than ever. Yeah, to jump in on that, uh, actually. So when I was running um, Insurrection with Brenton Lingle on the actual radio, uh, my co-host was George Martinez, uh, Honorable George Martinez, who is the former U.S. ambassador of hip hop, real position. <laughs> what, what's a radio? Um, it's, it's, it's a very old boomer thing that no one, none, none of us millennials and zoomers can understand. Um, you don't need a headphone for those. Those are, that's always nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, so when I was on the radio with him, my co-host was honorable George Martinez, who I met through, uh, Occupy Wall Street. And he very famously said, you know, all politics is local. Uh, and it, it's very much true. The, the sort of national, large politics in a way you know that is just an outgrowth of what is happening you know directly within your community um the proud boys example you know was great um you know i mean not great i'm not happy to hear that obviously but um yeah particularly no, not boys. yeah particularly not when uh i somehow online was made aware of like the very first Proud Boys like bar meetup ever. I don't know how it happened. Uh, I had a friend who was like a really great activist and I somehow like a left wing activist. And I somehow became friends with a guy who looked just like him, but with dark hair who wound up being a, a proud, like one of the very first Proud Boys. I was like, I found your evil twin. Um, <laughs> He's from the mirror universe in Star Trek. It's it, dude. He had a goatee. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so like all politics very much is local, um, you know, and be they, you know, I lived in Harlem, Sugar Hill, Harlem for 10 years. So like the idea of local politics was stop and frisk for the longest time. Like, you know, there was a, I still remember there was a famous video put out by The Nation, um, which uh, had a young man who's, who was actually like a junior police explorer. Um, and he wound up like getting accosted about three blocks from my door, like by cops who, you know, made fun of the fact that his dad was only a traffic cop and threatened to break his effing arm for being a mutt, um, you know, and seeing that and seeing that happen, not on the news to some people I don't know, but like somebody I've probably walked by on the street, you know, on streets that I know, like, it's it's incredibly, um, I guess, disconcerting. Um, and it also goes to show uh, recently, you know, in Manhattan, we had a, a, an older white guy show up 
like at the UN with a freaking sawed off shotgun uh, threatening to shoot himself. And it really got me thinking just like, you know, uh, there was a black homeless person several years ago in New York who was filled full of holes by the NYPD because he reached for a Metro card. But this guy makes it all the way to the UN with the shotgun. And, you know, beyond it being a, a ridiculous injustice, as far as like just security in Manhattan goes, like actually being safe from dangerous people, um, you know, the state is absolutely terrible at doing that. So I, I guess what I'm saying uh, in kind of a long, drawn out, circuitous way here is that, um, you know, local politics is the flip side of the coin from national politics. And if you focus just on national politics, um, it's like t turning on your uh, ceiling fan during a hurricane. I mean, you can do it. Does it have an effect? Yes. But does it actually matter? No, it's not going to stop the hurricane. I, I can tell you've never lived in Florida because you want to leave the fan <laughs> running as long as possible to dispel the humidity. <laughs> but, <laughs> just, just a pro tip. But yeah. no, that's no, I'm well. sorry. I, I don't live in your gross swamp. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm trying to think of a positive thing to say about Florida <laughs> and I'm going to throw it to contraband while I do that in my little um, corner. <laughs> yeah. Like local politics. I think there's one thing I want to say about it really, which is um, you're definitely right in recognizing that people in their local communities are not connecting as much. I think that has a huge, um, has had a huge impact on people getting involved in their local politics because we've lost a sense of community, a substantial sense of community. Um, I think people are really sleeping on the impact that that's gonna have on us, that it already is having on us um, because we're human beings and it's, uh, we're not supposed to be in these individual silos. And um, ultimately people are gonna realize uh, that reality because things are only gonna get worse here until we uh, learn how to uh, work together again and to realize that um, we live in the same country and we live in, the, we live in the same places and we eat at the same places and we, you know, entertain ourselves at the same places and we go to the same doctors and et cetera. And we need to, you know, get back to an understanding that, um, we are all in this together. And I think that if anything, national politics has, uh, made a lot of people, uh, be dissuaded of that notion. And so I agree that, Local politics are important, but I think it's going to be very tough for any creator to actually build any kind of momentum off local politics unless they're actually going to be involved in running for office or uh, or involved in trying to get someone else in office. Um, I'm not sure you could just be, you know, a I can content creator. For I can attest politics. to that as, as a content creator who just puts out local. Yeah. Uh, I, to, to, to play off of that really quickly, and listen, I'm sorry, BZ, were you going to say something? Uh, yeah, I have some, I have some thoughts, but I didn't mean to interrupt contraband. If, if, if you no, know, no, no, that's it. Go ahead. Thing. But um, I, I, I did, I do want to say, yeah. And, and this almost dovetails very well into the other thing that got, you know, I'd said I wanted to kind of talk about, which is, you know, the online sphere and, you know, this, you're kind of getting into that with like, what does a creator do? Mm -hmm. I think what I'd love to see is like, if you're a big channel creative, you obviously there's no way you're doing that without like, OK, you, you you have the facilities, you have probably a team of some people to help you throw a little bit of that. at doesn't even have to go on your channel. Just go find a local. I hope they'll find local orgs because like people who follow Destiny or these big Twitch streamers, like the only praxis that ever gets thrown to me when I'm just like, why is anyone listening to these people who just have opinions and play video games and and spout their opinions online? And they, they say, like, oh, they raise money for a thing, this or that. These big charities. I'm like, OK, but. The one thing um, I would say is like it it would be really great for a lot of people who are really immersed in the online world, like whether it's Twitch or you take in a lot of and I love the YouTube creator field, like the essays. I just watched an amazing one on anarchism. I'm excited <laughs> to interview the author of um, Anarche. But mm -hmm. the um, the thing that I think and, you know, I'm going to ask him about because I know he does local stuff. He does local organizations. Take your radical ideas, the ones you're certain about, the ones you get hot on Twitter about or Twitch or whatever, and take them to local people. But the point is, 
take them with some certainty or, or, or with curiosity. I want to see more people adopt a position of curiosity because while I'm an anarchist, it's the only reason I adopt that level is that label so easily is because I feel like it's a posture that is aligns with that. Like I'm here to learn. I'm here. To, I have a, it, it simultaneously has a belief. It has a faith in people and a skepticism in people when they develop power and power structures emerge. Mm-hmm. So I have a, I can, I have talked to every source I work with, like locally offline in the offline world. I tell them I'm an, I'm an anarchist and I work with liberals and communists and tea party people and far out there trump people and the last thing i and and none of them have a problem with it when i'm just like look it means my orientation is not left and right in economics it's up and down it's power and they all really respect that i've had one or two people be like i I might be an anarchist when i shorthand it for them like that but the last thing that just i'll be done and on the local level is uh you know the there the, uh, uh, in the local world that I'm in all the time you will find like wrongly convicted people and 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 other people that are that that suffered this political retaliation from a councilman or a prosecutor and those are all like little conspiracies in your town like, <laughs> and it's no wonder and I know this segues into another topic later but I did want to make sure I get it out it's just like that's one thing that's fomenting so much distrust in the world. But I don't want to jump on that subject because, like I said, the online left is something I'm really like. I follow the Vouch, Destiny, all these different things, almost as like a lurker, you know, the lurker term. And I'm just like, what is going on? And I love telling the normies about, like, do you realize these people? <laughs> you're, 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 you're escaping Plato's cave and telling them about the same kind of show that's going on. <laughs> You know, you, so it, it, yeah, it, well, it, hang on, hang on, uh, Bobby, before you jump uh, off well, on that. Um, you know, there was uh, no, there was really well, it's your show, but I know well. <laughs> there there was really something I wanted to segue into here, uh, as you know, BZ was talking a little bit about one of my favorite subjects, and that is specifically how, um, from an anarchist perspective local politics are pretty much the most important thing you can be doing. Uh, Buenaventura de Rudy, um, you know, uh, the real life uh, anarchist that this comic series is based on, like famously quoted Rudolf Rocker um, in saying that we make the world, but we make the path by walking it. And it is so incredibly important, not just that you have the right ideas in your head, because we are materialists, you know, it's not enough to just think something, you actually have to go into reality and practice it. And so like, yeah, praxis is mutual aid. Praxis is helping your neighbors. Praxis is gardening. Praxis is, um, you know, building alternative structures that can help you and your community survive um, when the main structures fail. Um, And that's something that I have become uh, very interested in uh, recently, largely because of, you know, COVID and the atomization. And so like, you know, in, in one instance with the online world, uh, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people getting caught up in the culture war. I'm seeing a lot of people, um, you know, kind of just get led around by the media and angry at whatever the the media has decided they should be angry about at at a given time. At the same time, you know, I've shrunk my world down to just myself and my immediate neighbors and their families. Um, And, you know, building that level of community and being there for other people is so much more important than, um, you know, having uh, the latest uh, hot take about whatever. Uh, And to to, to cap this off, there is one channel I do want to give a shout out to, uh, and that's uh, American Johnson of Non-Compete. Him and Luna Oi um, are one of the only quote unquote bread tube creators that they have their channel and a whole second channel like the breadcast that is directly, um, you know, involved, not just simply in fundraising as BZ brought it, but in activism, in in actual real life activism. Uh, And so like, I really think that you, as if a content creator happens to cultivate that kind of audience, it can be very, very powerful, but the, the incentive to do it, is not there from a financial standpoint because capital will resist uh, building any kind of dual power structure. Uh, the people that run our society don't want us 
trying to take, um, uh, you know, our own community and our own fates in our own hands. They want us to remain dependent on them because that is convenient for capital. They want us atomized because if we are atomized, we have to buy more things and we are less able to oppose any kind of agenda that the ruling class puts forth, uh, you know, be that via banking, medicine, po political, whatever. So like they, they want you in a, situation where you simply um you know depend on the system itself and you don't have these important connections with other people in the community and to, to add on a little bit to what you were saying um i, I know i've discussed adorno with probably everyone in here because i <laughs> i evangelize dialectic of enlightenment ad <laughs> yeah, ad nauseum too much uh but you, uh, if you haven't read the book you definitely should but uh, what Brenton's talking about with uh, what capitalism does um, to industry, it also does to culture. And I yeah. think part of the problem that we're facing as left of center content creators is that our content is a little more hard, uh, a little more difficult to mass produce um, than right wing content is because it's a lot harder to have a conversation like we're having now um, than it is to sit in front of like a green screen and yell that Star Wars is too woke <laughs> because there's too many... Uh, 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 droids and Star Wars or whatever they're they're complaining about this week. Um, we also don't have the funding um, behind us because we haven't really proved that this um, sector of uh, communication is a profitable thing to be reproduced ad nauseum. So like when you go to the grocery store, there's 50 different varieties of essentially identical potato chips for you to buy. It becomes the same thing with culture. Once something is profitable, there's like 50 or 60 different varieties of that same thing, like Marvel movies, um, Star Wars, uh, changed uh, science fiction for, for decades, et cetera. Uh, so when somebody like Ben Shapiro gets like two or $3 million in Facebook ads to propagate right-wing propaganda, and that seems profitable, you see an entire industry develop around uh, propagating these. And so what we're doing right now, uh, we're in the um, sewing phase, kind of a building um, an alternative to that, uh, trying to replace bad ideology with good ideology. Uh, we're sewing right now, and the right wing is reaping. So it's kind mm -hmm. of frustrating, but... I think if we keep putting in effort and we keep um, kind of fighting the good fight over time, that sowing phase will eventually uh, morph into a reaping phase. And I, and I say that because I aped that off of Eugene Debs, who was talking about that with the labor movement. Yeah. <laughs> I would um, also like to kind of bounce off of what Brenton and Bobby have just said uh, is that one of the things that when we talk about building content creation and connecting it to local politics, there needs to be institutions that are able to sort of connect the people to their local government. I've struggled uh, to connect to my local government in the suburb that I'm in, um, in part because the only way you're going to know what the city council is doing is on their website. And anybody who's ever gone through a city council website will know they're not the best design. Uh, so it's not always... <laughs> But on the other hand, you also have uh, very not well-known local newspapers that either hawk the murders and things like I brought up earlier, but the other newspapers that cover the general area, like the Chicago Tribune, for example, get bought up by people like Randall Smith and Alden Global Capital. Um, and now I'm, I'm not an anarchist, but I am like a sock dem sort of liberal kind of person but even i can see that fundamentally there needs to be an entire media environment that connects people to their local government so that whatever your political affiliation is you have the information available to you to make informed commentary and decisions not just in electoral politics but in decision making in your own personal life your finances your food anything that can help you to survive as a citizen in your local area is dependent upon that. And unfortunately, we haven't had an adequate replacement uh, for the erasure of these local newspapers. Um, I'm, I'm a member of the UIS Journal, which is the college newspaper out in Springfield, and we're run through a nonprofit. Now we're, we're turning into the UIS Observer. and But really, you've seen a shift, at least in my hope, that towards nonprofit journalism to protect it from the for-profit sector. And I would like to he see uh, more people drawing attention to not only uh, media outlets on the national level being destroyed by this kind of thing, but local outlets also having to combine like the Chicago Sun-Times did with WBEZ to defend themselves against this kind of for-profit destruction of what should be a diverse and democratized media environment. 
It's important. Um, this is something that I, working in comics, um, this is something that I sort of uh, realized. Um, and it's that, like, you'll notice, if you look at comic covers a lot of the time, you will often see uh, a lot of red on the covers. And the reason why that's there is because our brains respond to red with interest because it looks like blood. So, um, you know, as we evolved as a species on this planet, we see that, like, if we were able to recognize blood, we knew that we were in a dangerous place. And then uh, suddenly our, you know, consciousness is boom, right there. This is why, you know, blood, TV violence, that kind of thing, uh, and bad news about horrible things happening um, and horrible people is so engaging. And particularly for for driving, um, you know, social media engagement. Um, I think right now the the single biggest uh, video on my YouTube, and, I, and I'm kind of glad of this, uh, but still, like the single biggest video that I have ever put out on YouTube with the most views um, was uh, uh, Trump supporter attacks Antifa with skateboard, and it, it was literally my friend uh, who uh, was active. Um, in uh like i think was it no no it was california got attacked by a white nationalist um gang and got a skateboard broken over his head during a uh latinos for trump versus blm and antifa like rally and um you know the thing is is that that brings people that locks them in and if you're youtube and you want to sell ads, you need those eyeballs on the screen, you need them engaged. And the, one of the easiest ways to do that is via bad news, via pissing people off, making them angry, and sowing discord. And you get, you know, essentially what's mean world syndrome, where uh, it used to just be uh, the elderly folks who would sit at home and get angry, uh, you know, and, and become frightened because they watched so much news and they didn't actually go out and touch grass. Um, <laughs> And then just just really quickly to uh, to put a capper on this, um, it, you know, as far as what social media does to people it, when it comes to atomizing them and to, to driving engagement, you know, because we have. So you mentioned earlier, Bobby, that, um, you know, when something is successful, it spawns a lot of imitators, essentially, and you get kind of a sameness of culture. This is an inherent problem with markets, like as an economic unit, because markets are inherently biased towards previous actors within that market. The best way to understand this is like Vegas odds on a horse race. Um, you go in, you drop $100,000 on a horse, suddenly a bunch of other people are going to be dropping money on that horse because they think you know something they don't. So monkey see, monkey do. And we can get into these really awful economic spirals where uh, people like Ben Shapiro, uh, people like uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, people like Stefan Molyneux, you know, can get a lot of attention and make whole careers out of essentially being awful and pissing people off. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I think the way to deal with this is to disengage from the mainstream media and instead engage with your neighbors, um, because, you know, the alternative to that is, you know, either getting swept up in one side or another in the culture war or just retreating into fantasy and winding up like a QAnon cultist, which, hey, January 6th, we can talk about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I muted myself. Uh, I was going to say that's actually a perfect um, segue into the first uh, topic that really deals with 2021, is that we started the year off uh, seeing the effects of what we're talking about in media and in local politics, um, kind of in a really stark and frankly, for me, it was a very gruesome way on January 6th because people had been consuming all of this media that we're discussing uh, on the right for basically a year during the pandemic and they had been isolated and atomized um, to the point where they believed that Donald Trump won the 2020 presidential election, which he did not. Um, they believed that he got more votes than he did and that the uh, election was illegitimate. And while that's not necessarily um, abnormal for the right wing at this point, uh, it was shocking, I think, for everybody when 
Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol while the presidential election was being certified um, and violently attacked the uh, police officers who were uh, defending the uh, the Capitol. Uh, for once, I think Brenton's actually going to be on the side of the police in this case, <laughs> which is going to be really weird for him. Um, probably BZ too. Um, Insurrection but, makes for strange bedfellows. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Um, th they're resulting in, in several deaths, uh, severe injuries, and a, a stain on this country's honor uh, that will probably live in, in history for, for a very, very long time. Um, if you're asking me, but it, it's something that I feel that we're trying to kind of normalize and move past at this point when I think that the result, resulting riot that happened was a result of decades of coddling this failed right wing movement, pretending that their, their conspiracy theories were valid alternative thoughts to uh, actual truthful narratives and pretending that they had a point to the point where they thought that they could get away with storming the U.S. Capitol. And that's my initial thoughts on it, and I'll throw it to you guys for a minute um, while I try to collect them and put them more articulately. Um, contraband? Um, I don't think we've heard from you yet. Do you, you, you have a take here? Oh, man. All right. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a lot of thoughts about January 6th. I remember... I was actually working on uh, my website and my stream with uh, the person who runs my social media and I was leaving and I got a text from a friend of mine and he said, uh, yo, uh, you need to watch this. They're storming the Capitol. I was like, no, like what? Like, that's not a thing. Like, not <laughs> uh, Surely that won't happen in America. I had the exact and same thought, exact same yeah. experience. Yeah, it was very odd. I just sat in my car watching on my phone for a while, just like being like, what? Like this is this is happening. This is um, this is really happening. And I guess what I was thinking at that time was, how did they get to the Capitol? Uh, that was my first thought. I was like, how did this happen? Like, how is this allowed to happen? And because um, I just remembered the National Guard on the steps of the Capitol uh, for the BLM riot, uh, for the anticipated BLM <laughs> riot, but didn't end up turning yeah. into anything at all. And um, so I was very curious about that and just shocked, you know, that um, that this would happen. And I guess for me, the biggest thing has been the response, actually, to January 6th. Um, the charges, you know, they're still tracking people down and charging people even today. Uh, I think just last week, a, a couple people got charged. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It's like we see a reflection. I, I see a clear reflection for me personally. And because I deal with race content all the time, it's so obvious to me that um, the race of these uh, people who stormed the Capitol has played a significant role in how they're being treated with the justice system. I think that um, their defenses uh, against the charges are very uh, telling as well. Like they, I guess they just don't, they don't believe they, a lot of them don't believe they did anything wrong at first and have to be deprogrammed by law enforcement, um, which I also think is interesting that they're even taking the time to do that. And I'm not really sure why. You know, I'd like to be a fly on the wall of the decision makers for, for on that as well. But I just see them treating these people so much drastically different than other criminal defendants. I'm also um, a lawyer as well. Uh, so I'm very interested in that side of what's going on. Um, well, it, I, not to interrupt you, but having lived in D.C. while there were protests myself, uh, when the um, church protest happened outside the White House, uh, the the response to that was being buzzed with the military helicopters, having tear gas launched at them, having uh, agents from the Border Patrol and ICE come in to disperse a riot, which last time I checked, Washington, D.C. doesn't have a federal border anywhere around it. I don't think Virginia is a foreign country, although if you go out into Montrose, it gets a little weird. Um <laughs> But, Prince but William yeah, County also lived there for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, but you're you're absolutely right in that the response to the January 6th riot uh, 
insurrection, however you want to uh, phrase it, has been completely disproportionate to what it would have been if it was a left wing rally or if it was a protest for for civil liberties for uh, minorities in this country. Oh, well, it, it, it's funny. I think I've said before. Um, sorry, uh, progressive. I'll get I'll get to you in just a second. But like hmm. when I was uh, a kid, you know, growing up in the late 80s, early 90s, um, like I remember hearing Rage Against the Machine. And I remembered, you know, that the lyric, uh, some of those that work forces are the same that burn crosses. And at the time I was like, oh, yeah, that's a badass lyric. But it's a little is it's a little over dramatic. And like now, as a nearly 40 year old man, I'm like, yeah, some of those work forces are the same that burn crosses. And that, you know, um, this is actually what's so important about getting the anarchist critique of the state, which is not the government, it's the military and the police, um, out into uh, the, the world. Because you, you realize when you, you know, engage in an anarchist critique of power and an anarchist critique of the state and these institutions, you realize that, you know, what the law is meant to do is not to keep the peace. Rather, peace is kept in order to keep the property. And what property are they most interested in? Well, the state's primary constituents, which is the wealthy, the powerful, and the elite. And in abstentia of that, it is those who superficially resemble the wealthy, powerful, and elite. Um, and tear down, down, down. And who do they protect um, that property from? Well, from you and me and anyone who is judged to be unruly, anyone who is not a major property owner. So, you know, it is almost inevitable that within a state structure, you will have a racist a racist classist system of state violence, because that's all the state does is um, identify targets and deploy violence and the threat of violence in order to pr protect property. And, you know, you can, you know, this simply from, um, you know, pinko commie soy boy, Adam Smith, um, <laughs> who famously said in, in wealth of nations, um, you know, uh, what's the quote exactly. Um, uh, civil government, as far as it is instituted for the security of property, is in reality instituted for the security of the of the rich against the poor, or the security of those who have some property against those who have none at all. It, it wasn't soy back then; it was mutton. He was a, he was a mutton <laughs> boy. But, but uh, uh, oh, sorry, you were you were waiting. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, but if I may interject, and I don't mean to overrun anybody, but I will also point out that part of the issue that is is fundamentally the aesthetic of what we perceive as the ideal American, the real American is somebody who looks like me. The fact we see this in media and the way in which we talk about beauty and the way in which we see pictures of the patriot, they're usually somebody who looks like me. So if you have a, a culture as well that is fundamentally idealizing whiteness over other groups of people, you're always going to see something that reinforces that cycle of violence. And additionally, the FBI also on an institutional level, which kind of goes to your point, Brenton, fundamentally admitted that they have a blind spot when it comes to right wing violence. Like anybody who was watching Charlottesville or the things that happened after that could have seen that there is a problem with right wing violence growing in this country. But the fact of the matter is the FBI has not recognized that and there hasn't been enough pressure on it from on it from the ground up and within the institutions of government to make that change. So fundamentally, we have on one hand a cultural issue and then we have an institutional issue where the FBI, who is supposed to, in theory, ensure public order, blinds itself to this aesthetic that, hey, people who look like me, people who talk like me, who, who live in the communities that I live in are not necessarily my friends. And until we realize that, we will never really push back on this racist system that we continue to suffer under. You know, you know, it's funny. I'm having an old man Bob moment for a second in that I remember during the Obama administration, the FBI actually came out with a report that pointed out correctly that right-wing violence is responsible for greater than 90% of the actual terrorist attacks and political violence in this country every year. And when they came out with that report, the right-wing media and the Republican Party especially – uh, cried to high heaven that it was Obama cracking down on uh, political dissent. And they've, they're doing the same thing with January 6th. And I think it's also a function, uh, and I don't know, maybe you guys agree with me or maybe you don't on this, but my thinking is that this is also a function of the failed right wing in this country, realizing that it's becoming smaller and smaller and smaller every year 
and in every election cycle. And that if you're governing a country, you can either govern with the consent of the people or by having something used against the people to compel consent. And I think the Republican uh, right-wing movement, I think we just lost contraband, I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, there he is again. Welcome back. Um, and I think the Republican failed right-wing movement in this country is realizing that uh, inevitably they're going to lose the ability to actually govern through popular consent. And they're looking for a violent movement to uh, compel consent on the people. And we saw this in the last century. We saw this in Weimar, Germany with the fascist uh, movement there. We saw this in Spain. Britain and I have discussed this at great detail on his channel. We saw this in uh, Portugal. We've seen, we've seen this in Greece. We've seen this in Italy. We've seen this in, in dozens of different countries, in dozens of different contexts. And it feels very frustrating for me that we're not learning those lessons and that we're still trying to uh, reach out to this movement that seems bound and determined to impose itself through force on the American people. There's a, there's I, a famous quote. Oh, um, I think there's, yeah, there, there's a famous quote. I just want to go over right there. Uh, yeah. It's again from Buenaventura de Rudy. Um, no government in the world fights fascism to the death. When the bourgeoisie sees power slipping from its grasp, it has recourse to fascism to maintain itself. Uh, there are only two roads when capitalism breaks down. Uh, there is victory for the working class in which we get socialism and there is victory to the, for the fascists where we get barbaric tyranny and both combatants know what's in store for the loser. Um, you know, so we, as you've said, you know, we've seen this happen. People have articulated this problem again and again and again. Um, but you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people don't read and don't pay attention to history. Uh, BZ, you had something. Well, I, you know, one of the things that attracts me to anarchism is, is it gets to a real root problem, which is, you know, how our relationship and how we set up power structures and the ways that we are vulnerable to, you know, grant authority figures if they are, you know, in our in-group, um, a lot of leeway and, and, and a lot of undue skepticism to people outside. And I think January 6th, it's just a part of a continuum of, you know, the false consciousness that especially, you know, a lot of Americans on, on, on the right wing and people who buy into a lot of myths of America and capitalism, um, and, you know, that's what we're ultimately working to extricate. You know, when I, you know, I'm not, my inclination when I see like January 6th happening isn't like, I, I hope the FBI gets better at their job. It's, you know, because the, if we arrest and round up all these people, investigate them, it's not changing the fact that, like, there's a cultivated false consciousness and it's not just the right. You know, the left is just as easily susceptible or, the you know, the liberal. And like you say, when it, it, what you keep seeing in history is the center will often kind of err towards like the right wing thoughts when 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 there's safety issues like you know 9 11 what's our reaction like oh we, we allowed the patriot act and that can only happen with the scared you know swell of the center of the country and then we slowly move right and then the liberals start endure being like okay with certain policies they didn't like under obama or under bush because obama is continuing them and then like I said, there's just there's just a false consciousness problem all across the board, and it keeps leading to issues like this. But it's certainly troubling to think about where we are, you know, with the fact that like the reality that so many people live in that has led them to that. And I'll say on bringing it back again to like very like local connections to people's um, people's like the way they dig their heels in on a partisan level. Like I'll say. Here in Cle Cleveland and Cuyahoga County, and this is true is also in, in New York where you have um, one party control of an area. Um, and like in Cleveland, that party is the Democratic Party. Well, a lot of people here see the corruption of the machine because they're not, you know, just giving the Democrats that it's not a trusted authority to them. And so they rightfully think like, well, the enemy of my enemy must be my friend. And they go grant authority to and credibility to the Republicans. And the thing is like, well, no, you're not wrong that the Democrats are corrupt as hell in this town, but the Republicans aren't much better. That said, though, in these circumstances, you will find the, the Democrat is just another climbing machine piece of crap. And 
the, re the Republican running in that race. Maybe he's got some ideas on finance that trouble you, but he's actually someone who knows and cares about his community and is more in it and not looking at politics as a, just a career ladder. So I, I don't know. Like I said, like January 6th, it gets systemic for me. I, I agree, and a little bit I, I disagree because I'm I'm a sock dem, so I'm I'm a filthy statist. So you guys probably <laughs> don't like me that much for that. But yeah, Connor and me, we're in the filthy statist club. But can I, um, can I just make one quick tangent on like you're just, getting the you know, down twinkle. You're getting two down twinkles. No, I'm not down twinkling <laughs> as much as what I what I say to my communist friends who argue with me about when we get into. I just say like to me, anarchism. It's outside all those things like everyone should be in it you should be an anarcho sock dem you should be seeking to flatten power as much as possible and have the mentality of you know what i think anarchists adopt i'm not i don't think anarchism is a is a path towards a system as much as a path towards like evolution in our understanding and relationship to power that, and that that's a good and healthy attitude that i think more people could embrace um but from my perspective on January 6th, and I think contraband would have a, a useful um, input on this as a lawyer. Um, nominally, we have a deterrent um, and a retributive justice system in this country. And the fact that we don't use that to deter right-wing terrorism, it feels like that the weak response to the January 6th riot uh, will only encourage uh, more and greater acts of violence in the future. And I don't know if you guys agree or disagree on that one. I mean, I completely agree with that. I think that, you know, it'd be silly for us not to expect that in the future. And it's also just part of a pattern that we see in terms of the way this country deals with white supremacy in general, right? Like, I mean, this country has been supporting white supremacy. It doesn't fight against it. So uh, this is just the next iteration of what this country has always done um, from my perspective in terms of race. Um, but yeah, man, January 6th, I just, to me, yeah, like when Trump was elected president, I was like, there's no, <laughs> there's no greater exemplar of the power of white supremacy than the fact that Trump was elected president. Yeah. And um, I don't know, January 6th then was like, you know, hold, hold my beer here. And uh, <laughs> I think that that's a pretty good one um, because we can see from start to finish, from the time that they were storming the halls of the Capitol, you know, searching for lawmakers and smearing crap on the walls um, to the time where, you know, they're even still being tracked down today. They haven't found the person who was planting bombs out there, um, you know, dragging their feet and, and uh, you know, the charges being minimal. Even the judges who are hearing the cases, uh, mentioning that they even think that some of these charges are are too few and too uh less and uh you know it's just more of the same from my perspective and i do think that um you know stand back and stand by as trump said yeah. i mean that that still holds you know that's that's what america has always said um and uh i do think you can expect it to increase in intensity and in violence in the future, unfortunately. And what's a bigger what's a bigger example of a false consciousness Americans live under in this country than not acknowledging the white supremacy baked into the fabric? Mm -hmm. That's what yeah, that's what I'm saying is like if we don't correct that, these people, you know, they're not willing to even rec recognize the need to look at their history, look at the resistance to critical race theory we've seen. And there was, you know, forget about January 6th. I mean, I don't know about you guys in your town. We had a storm of uh, uh, MAGA folks running for our school boards. Yeah, I, I was going to do horrifying. I, I was going to uh, do Biden's first year as president next, but I think that actually leverages into issues in education that we wanted to discuss, too. Uh, because over 2021, we saw a really disturbing rise of anti, quote unquote, critical race theory activism in this country. And odds are, if you're listening to this, um, probably with the exception of contraband, um, maybe Connor, I don't know if you've actually read any critical race theory uh, for fun. And I have. Me I have. Oh, you, ha you have? Mm -hmm. Oh, you do. There you go. Under the introduction uh, by Richard Delgado. Oh, that's nerd. Good, yeah. Well, I, I, did, <laughs> I, I did too because I'm a sad, lonely man who reads a lot of weird philosophy. 
But like, there's a, a, not a great odds that people in your life have actually read Critical Race Theory, and yet it became a national sensation in 2021, and it became a rallying cry for right-wing candidates on school boards, uh, gubernatorial elections, and uh, uh, for domestic policy in various states, including my own state in Florida. And what was disturbing for me about that is that this anti-CRT campaign that's been waged over the last year is almost identical to one that was waged about 100 years ago in Germany. It was not called um, critical race theory then. The Nazi party called it uh, cultural Bolshevism. And it was a made-up conspiracy theory to run Jewish people out of academia, which actually resulted in Adorno, who I'm going to evangelize again, uh, having to flee uh, Germany and come to America. Uh, numerous philosophers actually were run out of uh, academia in Germany. And to see it repeated almost verbatim on Fox News, on the internet, and everywhere is a very, very disturbing thing that came out of 2021. And, yeah. it was, and, and we see how effective um, Nazi propaganda was because it's still effective in 2021. And we, we saw uh, most notably a governor get elected in Virginia based primarily on the back of pushing cultural Marxism on people. We saw in Florida, uh, in my own state, we had our governor pass like three or four anti-CRT bills through the Congress restricting academic freedom in my state. And we saw various uh, right-wingers. Uh, we saw some of them would actually try to start a University of Austin. Uh, that's the Dollar General <laughs> knockoff of the University of Austin, Texas, that I, I'm pretty sure has fallen apart already. Um, mm -hmm. We saw... Uh, Jordan Peterson rise back to being prominent, pushing that same Nazi talking point. Uh, most shamefully, I brought him up earlier, but Ben Shapiro has pushed this. Um, somebody who should definitely know better. Uh, we've seen Stephen oh, Crowder. He does become, know better. He just doesn't care. Yeah, this is very disturbing. And uh, we've seen Stephen Crowder become incredibly popular. Uh, we've seen this, uh, what should be a quote unquote alt-right talking point, become a mainstream of the failed right-wing movement in this country. And I think that's a serious issue in education because there's a chilling effect on teachers and it, it, it restricts people's ability to learn accurate history of the United States when anything that's critical of the predominantly white supremacist narrative that the right wants to push is called CRT and it wants to destroy the West and take your toothbrush. And the, yeah, this I, is really oh, I important. Think, I think uh, Connor had uh, something for. Oh. Real quick. I would actually like to add to that because as much as CRT, the conspiracy theories about CRT are an extension of the cultural Marxism and cultural Bolshevism myth, I would also like to say it is an extension of white rage, as uh, pronounced by Dr. Carol Anderson. Uh, she talks about how racism in the United States creates resentment within the white white population because they're always afraid of losing their political power. And that has been one of the reasons since 1964 onward, white Americans have consistently voted for the Republican Party because they have consistently uh, upheld the white supremacist narrative about the government is coming to force you to associate with African Americans. That's why you saw white flight and things like that. But more than that, for the first time in really the entirety of the history of the United States, White Americans have seen their demographics decline to an extent that, that they actually are worried about becoming a minority. And why would they ever be afraid of becoming a minority? It's <laughs> not that white, white uh, Americans. Are, are you saying minorities are mistreated in America, sir? <laughs> I do believe I am. Um, Gasp. But, but I would say that it really is the intersection of prejudices because it's, it's, it's anti-blackness involved in it because it's attacking scholars like Kimberly Crenshaw, who, despite what James Lindsay may say, is not a race essentialist. The whole point of intersectionality is to destroy race essentialism. And, and all of this really is an intersection of anti-Jewishness, which comes with the cultural Bolshevism, and combines it with anti-blackness to appeal to the oldest prejudices in America as an electoral strategy. Yeah, you know, they're going to the well, man, and they got that ladle out and they're using it. And I think that it's also interesting how the whole critical race theory panic happened, right? It's it's all the machinations of Chris Rufo and uh, James Lindsay. And all James Lindsay had to do was go and, and call himself a world level expert, whatever that is, in critical race theory. And, and all Chris Rufo had to do was, uh, as he transparently on Twitter stated um, increased negative associations with critical race theory any way that he could um, to turn it toxic. And he was very successful about that because there's already a foundation to support him in doing that, which is 
this nation's history with white supremacy. And it worked easily and like a charm. And despite the fact that so many progressives are working so hard to get policies passed, like health care, like, um, you know, the infrastructure bill that eventually did get through at least, and, and other pieces of legislation, look how easy it was for these two gentlemen, random guys, to just uh, end up in Congress in a short amount of time after building up negative associations with critical race theory and have all this legislation all across the nation being put out. I mean, it happened uh, in a flash. And again, uh, I, don't, I, I put that in the running with the most uh, prominent exemplar of white supremacy in recent times. You know, there's been a lot of, to, to play off of that, there's been a lot of, and I think one of the reasons this got so big on the right, uh, recently on the, the far left kind of bread tube sphere, there's been a lot of tea spilled over uh, dialectical materialism and materialism versus idealism. And a lot of people misunderstand these terms. Um, they think idealism means being I idealistic, having high hopes for society that you want to put in. Uh, and materialism, they confuse it with realism or they confuse it with like consumerism and the idea of like, like Madonna's uh, material girl kind of idea. But really what these two philosophical concepts are is materialism is ultimately the idea that all of reality or um, at the very least human society is driven by material concerns, which is things that actually happen in reality. So, um, you know, Sark famously said, existence precedes essence. There is no essence. We, we are what the world makes us and what we make ourselves in the world. Our views and ideas and how we interact with the world are shaped by our social relationships to other humans and to institutions. That is not how right-wingers think. Right-wingers think, and Jordan Peterson said it perfectly, uh, they are idealists, philosophical idealists, in the sense that Jordan Peterson famously said, um, you know, uh, people don't possess ideas, ideas possess people. So when someone is a political, philosophical idealist, what they're thinking is that the, the world is driven primarily mentally by human ideas. So what does this mean? It means that right-wingers are constantly looking for the source of the bad ideas so they can get rid of that source of bad ideas and we will have, you know, political, um, you know, uh, harmony. So when they see, um, you know, the, uh, the reactions to the George Floyd killing, when they, when they see BLM becoming really big, when they see direct action and when they see stuff like CHOP slash CHAZ and police being defunded, what they think, they don't think these people are responding to some, that these people are hurting and we need to deal with their problem so that we don't have this level of social discord. Instead, they think all of these people have been led to do this by an evil ideology. Um, and, and it just goes right into the, the inherent way that most right wing brains work. Um, you've seen this in fascist movements throughout history. You see it, um, you know, even when I was debating Stefan Molyneux. It really came down, and even the war on terror, and if you look at like what Sam Harris has said about how a nuclear first strike against Isla Islamists might be necessary because they have these bad ideas and they are dangerous, rather than looking at the material conditions that lead people to think that the right thing to do is to engage in uh, a war between Islam and the West. You know, again, I say all the time, ideology and religion, it is the slave of the material. When you uh, become religious or when you become ideological, you will interpret that ideology through um, what makes sense to you in your life, the way you deal with problems, the way uh, things that you would particularly benefit from, which is why you can get people who read the same holy texts and come, and come away with very wildly different interpretations of the exact same thing. It's because they are leading different lives and different things make sense to them in that context. And so like when the right is always looking to find that that those terrible ideas that are chipping away at this wonderful society we have built, rather than take a good hard-nosed look at the actual problems and realize we need to solve them if we intend to keep this society stable. 
you, you know, it, it's funny because it, it comes back to how um, the culture industry will dumb down the culture products it puts out to the basis possible levels. And James Lindsay and um, Chris Rufo are two great examples of that uh, because the culture industry has gone from uh, the 1960s where Britain brought up Sartre uh, being in nothingness, the stranger uh, the second sex by uh, De Beauvoir, which is a really interesting feminist book. Um, uh, Hannah Ardent, uh, even Heidegger were bestsellers and they were on the shelves of like working class people in this country. Uh, and the culture industry has uh, replicated and dumbed that down to the point where instead of like the great existential thinkers being on your bookshelf, now you have uh, Jordan Peterson being paraded around as a public intellectual. And that has definitely contributed a lot to problems in education because when people's idea of a public intellectual or uh, a professor is, say, Jordan Peterson or, or Chris Rufo or, God forbid, James Lindsay, uh, I think that limits Ben Shapiro. The, well, I don't think people would think of him as a professor. Oh, uh, professor. A, oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you said. I, I, I thought you were saying intellectual. Uh, both, I or guess. Philosopher. But, <laughs> oh, the philosopher. cool kids philosopher, supposedly, <sighs> according to the lamest person I, on I, the freaking planet. I'm trying to get through this, Brenton, without opening my bottle of 25 year old Japanese whiskey. So I'd appreciate a little bit of assistance. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, it's already open. But uh, it limits your imagination of what an educator can be or what a public intellectual can be. So you have these people who are trained to assume that, yeah, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson are these public intellectuals, and they come at higher education thinking that that's what they're going to get. And they're unprepared to I, I either deal with complex ideas, or they don't even want to pursue those ideas because their imaginations have been limited so much. And that's what I'm really worried about with these anti-CRT bills, is that it's going to constrict those educators that are trying to actually... Um, expand the horizons of their students. And I think contraband, uh, I think you're an educator, right? That's right. That's, I was about to jump in, you know, as, as the teacher of this group here. Hmm. I am a mathematics teacher for the last 16 years, K through 12 mostly, right now community college. But yeah, I, I think that, to be honest, um, most people have no concept of how, how bad things are in education. You know, the CRT thing is something that has shone a light on some of the problems, but ultimately um, this country's rankings in math and reading and, lit and literacy have been declining for literal decades. Um, the majority of Americans uh, read, don't even read at like an eighth grade level. Um, I, I feel like people are una either unaware of that or just like don't take that into account when thinking about what's happening around us. There's a lot of ignorance. Can I ask you a question feeling... about that? Yeah, go ahead. How do you approach people with that? Because I've approached people with that and they get really angry about it because they think I'm calling them stupid. Like, well, I mean, I mean, listen, you either know how to read or you don't know how to read. You know, you either know how to do math or you don't know how to do math. Fair, like, fair I, point. I, I, yeah, I, I, it's not a judgment. It's just a fact. And, yeah. you know, I, facts make people mad sometimes, right? You know, it's that's true. how Shapiro got his facts over feelings thing. Which stole that from me. I was doing that <laughs> way before Shapiro was. Bre Bre Brenton did it before it was cool. I, I literally, I wrote that in a play um, <laughs> and, and it was only because like I was using that like in message boards before anyone had ever heard of Ben Shapiro. Um, but like, <sighs> wait, Brenton, before you go on, yeah, 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 I reminded me of like walking into a bar and I met the number two, the guy who was like runner up to Gilligan from Gilligan's Island. He oh, just God. really gave me all that energy right now. <laughs> <laughs> that was supposed to be me. Flip, flip, flip your scarf, you hipster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You know, it, this is uh, to just play on this really quickly. And I, I want to knock it back to you again, the educator. Um, so I have kind of a unique experience in I have sort of run the gamut between going to the best of public schools in the country, which was, you know, those in the DC suburbs and Prince William County, because that's where, you know, the, the, you know, I was in school with the son of a Senator. He was a total dick. Um, you know, um, I went from that 
to like an incredibly ritzy all boys boarding school that cost about as much as college to go to for high school. Um, and then I also, I finished out in like my final two years in like a, a tiny public school in, in Russell County, Kentucky. And what amazed me going from these really good schools to this school that I think is more representative of, you know, what, public education is across the nation. Um, for instance, we had stopped doing accelerated reader in the fifth grade. When I got there, I had assignments to earn a, a certain amount of points on accelerated reader as a junior and senior in, in high school. Um, you know, I mean, I had a, I had a substitute, or no, I'm sorry, I had a social studies teacher um, who stopped when they were talking about like the Scopes monkey trial to say, if evolution is real, why don't we see ourselves evolving now? I got witnessed to by an art, by one art teacher who tried to perform an exorcism on like my, on my friend because she, she literally thought he had demons in him. And the other art teacher had a dream. I, this was my first political engagement. I had to go to like a school board meeting and argue that Harry Potter should not be stripped from the school library because our art teacher had had a dream where God told her to enter the hearts and minds of the students. She must create a committee to overview books and remove them from the library. And you know, th this, this woman wasn't like a conscious fascist. I actually liked her personally, but ideologically she was a fascist. Did the exorcism work? No, no, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, go, ahead, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say, my, my buddy, uh, yeah, yeah, no, that demon is still running around inside. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you're illustrating right there the drastically different experiences people can have at different schools across the nation. That's definitely true. Part of the reason we tried to work on standardizing curriculum across the nation was to deal with that problem. Um, but ultimately, as a teacher, what you find if you get involved in any kind of uh, execution of policies that come down from the national level, what you find is that um, the people who are making decisions about how to impact education, um, they're not educators, they're not, and, and, or they are not consulting with educators in terms of how they roll out their policies. And that has caused all kinds of problems um, that really don't get talked about in the mainstream media until it gets to like the level where a kid is actually suffering because of these decisions. And then that becomes the story. Not like all of the decisions have led to this moment with this kid is having this experience. Um, so, you know, one thing that I'd like to see, I know we're, we haven't gotten to the 2022 yet, but like in the future is mm. more media focused on um, the decision makers and the power players in education and what actions they're actually taking um, because we're, there's a disconnect between the impact and the decision making right now in education. And the, bird, the blame is in the media anyway is being placed on teachers mostly um, as, it, as it has been traditionally. And that's not an accurate reflection of the problems in education. Because right, you're one of the last unionized industries that's kind of left in the country too. Well, not so, in my state. Uh, we're not allowed to have a union. Here. You're not allowed to have a union? No, it's against the law. Bro, I'm in Florida, and we're allowed to have a teacher's union. Wow. I, have a, I, have a, I have a fun education story from 2021. This is, this is what parenting looks like when you're a journalist. So my kid comes home, and he shows me they have this fundraiser they're doing called schoolstore.net. And he shows me, it's like, oh, yeah, if I get people to buy things from this company, then it raises money for my school, and then I get a prize. And I just immediately sit my kids down and I'm like, let's talk about the problem of middlemen. And I just say like, <laughs> I don't like all the stuff that's in between me giving money to the school for them. And so apparently it's like you can buy the supplies like, but anyway, so I get it and I, I don't like it at first glance. Then it's like midnight that night and I'm just sitting on my desk and I'm like, fuck it and i just start googling and i find schoolstore.net it's part of this whole web of these fundraisers with different names but ultimately the ownership goes back to um this guy and i thought it was a made-up name i couldn't believe it richard d crook who 
Then I find Richard. I'm like, is this a fake name? Is this a fake name? No, it's a real name because I found it in a Heritage Fundraise Heritage Foundation uh, annual report is like a mega donor to this right wing <sighs> think tank that wants to completely destroy public education. So it's like I luckily we have an awesome public school. And I told our principal, I told this in the social media group. I'm like, hey, y'all, look what I found. And the principal called me like a couple minutes later. And was just like, what? I had no idea. And I'm like, all right, I know they're they're good at hiding this, but that was that was a fun wild. I mean, are they good at hiding all it? the parents are giving <laughs> money to <laughs> this thing that's ultimately the the middleman is taking that their cut and putting it into dismantling public education. They they don't have to hide it when people don't care. Precisely. Precisely. Yep. They don't even have to think about hiding their tra covering their tracks. They don't care. They don't care if everybody knows. Well, I would also add that part of the issue, and it's not just in education, but in, in really in, in in political commentary, political opinions, op you know what they say about opinions, everybody's got one, um, but is that a lot of people think that the, the destructive forces that are around us are hiding what they're doing, when in fact, a lot of what they're doing is public information, and they have, will have full reports telling you that's what they're doing. But like nobody reads that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, exactly. But to, to add to the education point and the destruction of public education, one of the things that I think needs to be brought up a ton over and over again whenever somebody talks about the virtues of private education is that private schools below the college level are not covered under the IE, IDEA, meaning that if you are a disabled student in public education, you are entitled to an IEP, an improvised education plan. But if you are in a private school, there is no obligation on that private school to follow that IEP. There's nothing. So if you have, if you, for example, in like Chicago, whenever they talk about the, the mess that is the public schools out there, is they will say, well, we could have charter schools. We could have private schools. There'll be a replacement. But are we really going to ask the black people in, in Chicago to have to lose, to lose their IEPs for their disabled kids just so some other kids can get a good education? Everybody should get a good education. And that's not brought up nearly enough because it's it's seen as though, oh, those problems don't matter because those are just the disabled kids. Those are whatever term horrible term is used uh, you want to bring up that doesn't violate TOS. But it's over. <laughs> thank, thank you for not violating TOS and getting my channel new. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Appreciate it. We'll do it by the end of this. Don't you worry, Bobby. <laughs> I, I almost right. did earlier, I feel like. Uh, the, the other thing I just want to say about what you were just saying about charter schools being an alternative and that whole narrative, six out of, six out of seven African-American kids go to public school. So you would literally have to pluck them all out of the public schools and put them in charter schools, which it, it, as a plan makes absolutely zero sense. So I, I, I don't know how that became so popular as like, a way of fixing education or, or helping black people, but it's weird to me. I, 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 do to, I, to, I do have to jump in though and say, like, I, as someone who has always been opposed to like what charter schools are, we we succumb to the well. I, I think a lot of bullshit from one that courted us for our son, but we ultimately did choose homeschool for him. And I I know I was very I'm not good in the ac the traditional academic model. You know, it's why I'm learning by doing with journalism. You know, it's just like it's a the modality that that is like, you know, in public school when I was there, even just stuff like the times we do it. It's That's another thing where it's like I, you know, when I look at education, like we have all these realistic fights we have to make right now. But I also I, I, I get people's frustration with like, well, the public school, I want to try different things because there's a rigidity there. And that was what allured us to this one public school, which is how the kids were allowed to operate. Like, Oh, if your kid, he likes to pace in a circle while he reads a book, go for it. Um, things like that. And just questioning like where our, our model is set up and how much of it is inertia and how much of it is the best way to go. And like contraband said, the fact that like, these people who don't know a damn thing about policies make all these decisions. And by the time we find out about them and they're harming a child, they're so entrenched and impossible to roll back. Um, so I, I get a lot of people's frustration with school as a parent. My one kid is now youngest one is in school. Now he wanted to go cause he's more of a social butterfly. My oldest is still homeschooling because I set him up with some online stuff and we will spend time together reading things and being immersive. And 
you know, letting it flow in a way that follows his interest. And he's just a sponge and he loves learning, but he didn't get anything out of like public school. And if anything, he kept having problems with the traditional mode. What uh, with what contraband said uh, earlier about, you know, the people that are making the decisions for schools are not educators and are not consulting with educators. It is it's almost as if what we need is for the workers to control the means of production. <laughs> like if, if, if only there was some way that we could take workers in various industries like education and let them make the decisions as to how things should go. <laughs> this is where communism, well, that's crazy, this is where communism's vocabulary will fall flat and why I've spoken to people who like have lived under communism or whatever, and they're not super fans of it or, or but one thing that I like, it, I've recently come to realize is a limitation of it is like it puts everything in these economic terms. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I understand that like we we've come up through capitalism. So the economy is the center of everything, but it it's not. And thinking of teachers as producers or workers, like they do work or whatever, but there's something deeper in it than that. And part of a culture, I agree mechanically what you're saying mm -hmm. that they should be have. And this is where like, you know, I would overlay the anarchy and say like, expertise you know as for an, an anarchist you, you know my authority you tell me you have a degree in a thing or this thing or these important people like you eh, i'm very show me let me read your materials let me consider what you have and i'll, I'll consider you an authority and look at the breadth and depth of that because i don't want to be dismissed as a web developer or any of the other things i've done for money is like well you didn't go get a degree at this place Mm -hmm. when well, I can show you I've done the thing and I strive to learn and be better at it. So you're, you're inadvertently, um, uh, you're busy. What you're doing is you're, you're inadvertently paraphrasing Mikhail Bakunin from what is authority. Uh, you know, where he famously said, you know, I just learned it, about how anti-Semitic yeah. he is, but it, yeah, but lots of people wasn't <laughs> at that. I just read an essay about him actually. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for let's cancel Mikhail Bakunin. <laughs> but right. no, it, it, it was written by someone that that was like <laughs> he's a racist, but it's actually not an underpinning of what he said. And here's all his racist <laughs> shit. And it was like they probably the best way to handle it. Well, yeah. I, I think it's interesting though that you're bringing up something that's kind of legitimate in that parents do want to have an input on their children's lives because they're parents and they presumably love their children. And so it's understandable that they want to have an input on their child's education because education is so important, especially in this economy um, where it's, our economy is basically centered around how educated you are as a worker. Uh, but at the same time, you're right, uh, contraband, when you say that education really should be more in the hands of educators than it is because the people who are making decisions uh, are often elected or appointed by people who aren't educators. And we we see that with the CRT thing. Uh, we see that with the uh, mass protests about teaching American history. Um, we see that with the people who are running for school boards now who are running on, like, not making children wear masks. <laughs> um, Don't forget Betsy DeVos. <laughs> Betsy DeVos, who was the Secretary of Education for four years, who was trying to dismantle the public education system, whose brother uh, runs the biggest mercenary firm in the world, uh, and who yeah. made her fortune by exporting American jobs uh, in auto manufacturing. And, if I'm not uh, mistaken, student, uh, student debt. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not mistaken, I think they also got a lot of money from Amway. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't they also helping like spy on Democratic uh, candidates as well through like, like yeah Eric's... the the Palantir thing yeah, yeah that, they called that, it Palantir <laughs> yeah oh that was an issue in 2021 that I I didn't have on my list but yeah so Peter Thiel runs a firm called Palantir that Connor just brought up that uh, is basically a private surveillance firm that was in fact paid to spy on various political candidates mm -hmm. and now he's uh, supporting JD Vance for Senate. If, if 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 they're listening right now, I don't care. I put my thoughts on Twitter. You don't have to spy on me. Put your money elsewhere. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I'm on my on phone with uh, my friend a lot, and uh, he lives in California. And I'll say the NSA trigger words <laughs> to get your phone call monitored. And I'll say, like, <laughs> now that the NSA is listening, <laughs> how's that recipe for uh, brownies doing? <laughs> you want some shrimp fried rice with your NSA? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. I've always so like you know when um, when Occupy Wall Street was going strong, there was a lot of surveillance on various people, and I don't know if I ever uh, tipped anything off, um, but um, I, I've always wondered. Like at first, I thought that it would be great that whatever spook was assigned to like read me sort of became a fan and started liking my comics and plays. But I actually think it's better if he hates it and still has to read it as uh, for his job. So he's sitting there like, you hack! That's not how you write a scene! Brian, you're, ma- you're thinking of like, you know, this isn't the 1930s or 20- like You don't have, none of us have minders. They just collect it all. And when you ever become a problem, they go back and, and sift through it. And I'll tell you, you know, as someone who's been a civil libertarian, ex- mm-hmm. you know, extremist for a long time, there's nothing that, though, that'll bring you home to like, oh, this is an abstract fear of a tangible thing that you know, I don't want, whatever. And now that I'm like a journalist and thinking about like, I'm going at like state attorney generals and real hard and stuff like that. And at what point you, you know, you just think about how easily the state can, you know, mess with you if you're doing things like that. And mm-hmm. And I don't even worry about surveillance as much as like weird ways they can suppress you. That that actually kind of that discussion about surveillance, as funny as it was, did lead me into something that I wanted to discuss with you guys, uh, because 2021 was also the 20th anniversary of September 11th. It was the uh, 20th anniversary of the global war on terror, which is still kind of going on, but it was also the year that the Afghan war ended. And I was wondering what you guys thoughts were. Uh, I'll share mine at the end about, um, I want to interrupt. I want to interrupt Bobby because that's yeah. heavy and it's awesome and it's long. I want to do something fun before we do nine eleven. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I got a, I got a surprise for you guys. I, I think I think that's the first time um, that the words so fun I and nine eleven have been in the same sentence in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I went and looked up everybody's first tweets of the year. Oh, uh, nice. So uh, it's a nice collection, actually. And I didn't count anything that was a reply or, um, you know, just like a retweet. So it's like, uh, Mustache Bob, you uh-huh. called out uh, these failed GOP senators are rejecting democracy for uh, a failed reality host, Donald Trump. Uh, quote tweeting, um, Republican senators say they'll vote on January 6th to reject electors from certain states. L- l- let me ask you what time that was. So that was, what do we got here? 2.07 p.m. Okay, I was sober. Okay. <laughs> I would have been sober. I'm just here, trying so to see. I'll, I'll paste these in the chat because, yeah, uh, if you not, the Twitter advanced tools make this fun. So that was Bob. Uh, Brent, here up next. Uh-oh. Everything's going so slow on my machine. I got a, too many tabs. Oh, you know what? I blame. I have a whole bunch of Vice articles open, and they have yeah. a ton of ads. Yeah. <laughs> so while, oh. while you're finding it, I just want to point out, um, you know, that when you mentioned they were collating the data and only going out, it's it's really tough that you know mass surveillance has lost the personal touch. You know, <laughs> yeah, 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 I remember yeah. I remember mom and pop spooks that <laughs> you didn't know them, but well, you well, could the, have known them. This well, is some well, good material. Material to save, Brent. Yeah, and you do when you get get into like the online standup. Uh, so, Brent, your first one: uh, Southern California hospitals are currently overwhelmed. More to follow. Things will get worse before they get better. So, you're getting on the pandemic, right? Uh, and that was on January 5th, when you thought that was going to be before you knew that January 6th was coming up fast. And what did I tweet uh, on January contraband. 6th? Uh, your first tweet was about your first stream of 2021, given a rundown of what to expect content wise. So I'm actually looking forward to looking at that. But then, uh, I also saved your next tweet because it had, um, it was also on COVID. The vaccine distribution has been a disaster yet. It's as if Trump no longer exists. He bragged about organization of distribution of effort for weeks. This is an example of the major benefit white supremacy grants inoculation against the consequences of failure i like it i stand that, by it that's the presumption of competence inoculation from consequences i stand by it yes so what is it that uh, our progressive friend so uh connor i don't know uh what you did but you like scrubbed your timeline or something or your tweets only go back so far <laughs> I, so. Okay, so I think it, i found your first tweet on twitter <laughs> or at least it was august 4th um and it was about Nina 
and quote tweeting the the People's Party um, and the Nina Turner race. That's something I can talk about. And man, I can tell you, it disturbed me to no end. I went and watched one Chantel Brown stump speech. It was 12 minutes long, and I found someone who really knows Cuyahoga, like the county politics, to spend 90 minutes explaining how just about every single second of it was a lie. Yeah. That sounds like a, that sounds like a good future panel to do. It's real sad. Oh, and, um, from ITL. I've shared all these links in the thing so everyone can retweet them. And I'm very I, – I, I have a tweet that I just don't think got enough love because it was just a dumb thing. I wrote <laughs> – the the high man in the castle a series about an alternative reality where pot is not only legal it's mandatory <laughs> <laughs> oh that would be great no. i would watch that series unironically uh. um but i will say on that tweet front i do occasionally uh, run a tweet deleter just because i used to get into fight with anti-vaxxers like four years ago uh, and uh, they would respond to things that were like two years old and then like 200 uh, additional people would come at I didn't me. know that was a thing, a tweet deleter, like mass, like just clear yeah, you everything. Can delete all your tweets except retweets, it doesn't quite work. You can get it on your Apple phone. Oh, um, shit. But yeah, I, I definitely had a problem with them going after Nina Turner, and I was just like, I, I have my problems with Nina Turner. Like every other political figure, I have problems. I, I'm a pedantic person that way. But – at the end of the day, if you're not willing to show results, you don't get to criticize somebody who actually ran in the first place and showed up on the ballot. <laughs> I, I'm just glad I was sober <laughs> when I tweeted my first tweet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just or you had the sense to go back and delete those those late night ones the next day. <laughs> I'll tell you about the new year. <laughs> the the Andy uh, what was the Andy Cohen on yeah. CNN? Oh my God, he freaked out. That was hilarious. <laughs> that, could, that could be our like uh, potpourri to bring up our spirits after the end of this. Oh yeah, uh, because oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were so nine eleven is was yeah. Well, that's uh, fucking a. <laughs> sorry, sorry guys, but Pe I th people I think... freaking out uh, about stuff on CNN is like half their content. I still remember um, when, you know when Bernie it was looking like Bernie was going to win, and what was it? Chris Matthews was losing his mind, thinking he would like uh, be executed by like Maoist style tribunals in Central Park. Um, and by the way, single best meme to come out of that was somebody stuck um, Bane's mask on Bernie, and it was like, "Start by freeing the oppressed." I love <laughs> police. <laughs> will <laughs> <am> I? <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I, my Bernie Sanders sounds too much like Trump, where I would try to do try to do an impression, but um, <laughs> it, it really does. Like my, my it's, it's sad, and uh, I feel ashamed. But uh, to get back onto a, a little bit of track here. Um, 20th anniversary of 9-11, 20th anniversary of the war on terror. Brenton Schilling a little bit in the bottom left corner there. Um, he thought I didn't notice him, but it, now he's muted and he's trying to talk to me. It's pretty funny. Um, I'm fixing my camera zoom, sir. I'm playing with you. <laughs> uh, I'm old enough to remember 9-11. I was in eighth grade. Um, I physically saw the towers come down. Uh, I did not think then that I would actually be a veteran of the war that ensued afterwards. Uh, but uh, let's see, 2015, uh, 14 years later, I was uh, 13. I went over in 2014. Uh, 13 years later, I was still in Afghanistan, <laughs> uh, still fighting that same war. And for 20 years, uh, we've lived with the uh, legacy of a national tragedy. And we've lived with the results of a, a war that ensued afterwards. And I think something that doesn't get discussed a lot is that the Afghan war continued for 20 years because we've made the political choice to build a military force that's a professional military force that can function with the augmentation of contractors without a draft. So for 20 years, we carried on a war that didn't impact the material conditions of the people living in the country who weren't directly related to a soldier or airman or Marine or war soldiers, airmen uh, or Marines. And the result of that was 20 years of not the most brutal fighting in the history of mankind, but 20 years of horror for the people of Afghanistan, um, also for the people of Iraq, but uh, we were discussing the 20 year of Afghanistan. We can discuss Iraq too, if you'd like. But uh, and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, veterans of that war. I've seen the numbers between three and seven hundred thousand 
uh, people who have served in Afghanistan. Uh, it's hard to count because people do multiple rotations. Uh, something that was worse about this war than previous wars is that um, Vietnam, you'd have one or maybe two tours. Three tours would be considered uh, incredible. But I've known people who have deployed five or six times, and they don't get counted uh, in the casualty estimates, which are hundreds of thousands of uh, Afghans, um, foreign fighters, uh, as well as 2,000 U.S. Uh, combat dead and 20,000 wounded. Uh, tens of thousands more have uh, taken their own lives after serving in Afghanistan uh, because of the horror that they witnessed. Uh, tens of thousands more are scarred for life. Uh, but we finally ended the war in uh, 2021, and I feel that the response to this was very disturbing for me. I know I'm monologuing a bit, and I'll, I'll let you guys get in in a second. But something that occurred to me in the aftermath of the U.S.'s withdrawal from Afghanistan was that the American people, and especially our political class, did not appreciate the reality on the ground in Afghanistan. The A Afghan National Army was supposed to have 300,000 combat-capable soldiers. Uh, in reality, most of those regiments only marched on paper, meaning that their commanders would collect pay and supplies for soldiers that didn't exist, lining their own pockets. Often they would work for opium distributors, um, and the central government had very little authority or ability to project power despite having it on paper. The result of that was that the Afghan government collapsed remarkably quickly, um, faster than the government of South Vietnam collapsed after we left that war, um, certainly faster than anybody expected it to. Uh, but what disturbed me about the aftermath of that is that I've started to see people have um, stabbed in the bath, back myths, by which I mean people are talking that like the liberal political class or the media stabbed soldiers in the back, and we could have won if we had uh, unleashed more violence on the Afghan uh, people, which is not true. I'll discuss that in detail in a moment. But um, the other thing that I saw it reminded me of a movie called Downfall. Has everybody seen this film? downfall it's a oh, great the nazi film. the meme where hitler hitler reacts to yeah yeah yeah, yeah um, i've seen the meme i haven't seen the movie the, the movie's there's great a, there's a chilling scene in that film um where the berlin is falling and the the commandant of the defense of berlin talks to one of the officers uh, in charge and says like okay berlin's collapsing around us guys time to time to pack it in and surrender to the soviets and the guy says we'll never repeat the humiliation of 1918 never and the end of the Afghan war reminded me of that a lot because I feel that we stayed so long and that a lot of people are so angry about how it ended because they feel it's a repeat of the humiliation of the Vietnam war. And I worry that that's going to seep into the cultural consciousness um, uh, in the next war and that we're going to stay even longer in another uh, brutal uh, asymmetric conflict. Uh, but those are my initial thoughts on it. Um, I'll, let you guys jump in, whoever wants to have a little bit of thoughts on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the end of the Afghan war. Um, I'll just add a few things. Firstly, I think it's important to note that most Americans did not serve in Afghanistan. Most Americans have, do, not, do not really see the relationship that we had with Afghanistan and still do in a way um, in the human way that people on the ground like you, Bobby, like my cousin Tom did, uh, who really saw the bloody reality of it it's to a lot of americans it's an abstract thing on the wall it's it's the news it, it only comes up when there's been a bombing or an attack or something like the withdrawal so i think any consideration of what happened in afghanistan and what any what uh, our government was doing has to consider the fact that a lot of americans who are looking at this have a blind spot it's an abstraction to them until it humiliates what they think is the national character and I think that's kind of playing into that uh, backstabbing myth that you're talking about. Yeah. So, uh, Bobby, you and I uh, did a, a, a stream on, um, of all things, Cobra Kai, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is a wonderful series. By the way, fourth season is the best one yet. Um, but, like, we were talking about, like, the flashbacks to mm -hmm. when Crease was in Vietnam. And, you know, it, it just occurred to me, that, you know, growing up as a red-blooded American male, I was, you know, raised to see Vietnam as uh, a disaster for the United States. Um, you know, that this country was able to uh, bring in communism. And, like, since then, you know, I, I brought up American Johnson and Luna Oi. They live in Vietnam. 
And the fact of the matter is, is that multiple times as I've, as I've gotten older and, you know, gotten out into the world and realized how things really are, as opposed to how they are presented in, in American schools and in American culture, you know, like I was joking on the stream, like, oh, well, Kreese was clearly the bad guy there <laughs> being <laughs> tortured by heroes, you know? Um, but like, you know, in, in, in a sense, like just, if you want to see, the example of how a government that actually values its citizens functions in a crisis, you have a perfect example in Vietnam, where, you know, they, people think it's a small country. They have one third the population of the United States for the original like wild type COVID, you know, um, they lost only 35 people to it. They, they that, no COVID deaths beyond 35 and only a couple thousand when Delta hit. And now that Omicron is hitting and I went and just looked this up. Uh, they are currently at um, 35, yeah, 36,266, which may so sound large. But then you look at the United States right now, we are up to 861,000 dead. And honestly, with Omicron, with how quickly it spreads, we're going to probably see well past a million before this thing is over. And the thing is, is that if you looked at Vietnam, what they were able to do because they were a socialist government um, is they were actually able, they didn't have to do this Sophie's choice between do you save the economy or do you save your citizens? Um, the United States chose neither. They chose to tank the economy and to kill all of our citizens. Um, whereas with Vietnam, not only were they able to keep their people safe and act contrary to profit, their economy grew all four quarters. This is the, the, this really illustrates and, and why I'm so ardently anti-capitalist Capitalist governments and institutions, even when they have the physical capability of taking important life-saving policy, they cannot do it because the economy and the politics are directly tied to economic growth and, and not just, but perpetual, perpetually growing economic growth. So all of the things that they could have done, they were disincentivized from having to do. And thus these institutions can never respond to a problem that cannot be solved by, by making a bunch of money for someone. So I, I think it's really, really key that like, if we didn't have Vietnam, if the United States had won and imposed capitalism on that nation, um, you know, we would not have this shining example of what a socialist model, however flawed it is, can actually do um, in at t today's day and age. And as like the, the world moves closer to war, possibly nuclear war, or um, towards more likely, uh, you know, peak oil and global war and like, you know, global devastation caused by climate change, we desperately have to look to extreme solutions to solve our problems because the time frame is just too short and our institutions are not set up to handle this. Okay, we'll, we'll definitely discuss COVID in a, in a moment, but uh, did anyone else have anything about um, Afghanistan uh, or 9-11? Um, I think BZ. Oh, I'm sorry. Right? I jumped in real, real quick. You can. I, well, I, I got he, he, he's, he's got a call in a second. Um, but I do want to, I just want to say like 9-11 um, for me, uh, I, I, I ask people a lot of times, like, what's what's your 9-11? Um, you know, how was your 9-11? I guess this is the you know, weird way. I, you know, I don't I think I've ever put it, but it because it's fascinating to me. Someone like, you know, you say you went through 9-11 in eighth grade mm -hmm. and then you're in school and then you're there for the first wave of like, what's our myth about why this happened? Um, and for me, I, I was like 22. I was alone in a house just watching it and absorbing it. And that's the genesis of my political consciousness. Like 9-11 is a very profound subject for me because I was just there like, I don't know anything that's going on. And, and then I started, you know, I from self-discovery found, you know, Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn and Gore Vidal. And, and the idea of authority became real central to me. I mean, initially I started thinking like, well, I guess I should be a Democrat because, geez, George Bush is awful and these Republicans are all for it. 
And, but then ultimately like my compass just centered around authority and it wasn't for like another maybe decade or five, six years that I met an anarchist and realized that didn't just mean no one's in charge. Let's break shit. Mm. So, um, yeah. And following nine 11 and, 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 and learning people's nine 11 stories and, and especially how Afghanistan, um, Bobby, you said you listened to my most recent, uh, episode of, um, I have a podcast called busy listening and I interviewed Nico Walker, who was an Afghan vet. And it was, uh, I never quite heard a rationale for joining up that he had before. I'm sure it's not uncommon, but he was uh, a young kid, like 19 something, and said like, well, if, if I'm going to be pumping gas and, and benefiting from this, basically it was like, yeah, what we're talking about, like, I'll, I'll put some skin in the game. Yeah, I, I had an eerie thing listening to that. And I know Connor, you have something and I'm sure contraband, you have something after that, but um, I had an eerie thing listening to that and that he and I kind of had the same thought. I enlisted later than 19, but uh, he, he said that uh, he felt that he was taking a, 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 a bullet for somebody um, who had like a wife and kids. And at the time I enlisted, I, I thought the same thing. And it was, it was weird to me because uh when I, if you caught me in eighth grade and I was going to enlist because we were all angry after 9-11 and the Afghan war was a product of that anger and kind of a revenge uh, for, for that um, assault on us, uh, that wound uh, that we hadn't felt as a country since like the 40s with Pearl Harbor. Um, if you caught me then, I would have said I was enlisting for revenge. But by the time I actually enlisted, uh, I felt that I was kind of taking the place of somebody else who had like a wife or kids or a family who would uh, have gone instead of me. Uh, but the fact that we just resigned ourselves to being in Afghanistan for that long um, as a product of the way we've chosen to set up our military to where we don't have to have a draft to carry on a 20 year war uh, is, is something that we need to examine as a country um, uh, as the Western, uh, the Western developed nations in general to use that placeholder that I don't really care for um, because it, it's our, our partner nations did the same thing uh, where the U S wasn't the only country uh, that was in Afghanistan. I ran into uh, Georgians um, funny story real quick. I actually almost shot a Georgian uh, priest in Afghanistan uh, because it was uh, it was two in the morning and I was trying to get a sandwich at the chow hall and uh, they wear the long flowing Dracula robes instead of a uniform. And they have like the iconic cross and there's good old Bob standing in line for a sandwich with an M4. Uh, and this Georgian priest comes out of the mist. And it's like two in the morning and I'm really tired. And I'm like, not today, Dracula, not today. <laughs> and my buddy's like, no, he's a priest. Don't do it. <laughs> but uh, we had Georgians, Czechs, um, Mongolians, which was holy crap. Uh, Ugandan contractors, um, local Afghans, uh, Estonians. Uh, and a, a whole cornucopia, uh, Italians. You got, a, you got an international brigade situation. Yeah, well, there, it was almost. the International Security Assistance Force. I actually have an ISAF patch still and a NATO medal from from going. And um, it, it's, it's something that we have to address, though, that we had a 20-year war that didn't impact people's material conditions and people stopped caring. Mm -hmm. Like if you ask somebody in like 2016, 2017, they would not really care about what was going on in Afghanistan. And... Um, I, I see Connor wants to jump in, so I'm going to let you. Uh, I'm just going to say a quick. I'm just going to say a quick bye, and oh. I might. I hope I can get back in here if you guys are still going, because uh, this has been awesome. And um, thank you so much for having me, Bob. But uh, carry yeah. on, kick ass, go Th progress. Thanks for coming. Nice to meet you, BZ. Nice to meet you. Um, but yeah, I would just like to say, on some front, I'm not. Uh, a great foreign policy guy. I'm more of a domestic politics kind of person. And that's kind of why if anyone had watched my live stream uh, when I was discussing with an army uh, ranger who happens to be a relative of mine, I got a little uh, cursed out. <laughs> or rather, not cursed out precisely, but there was a little bit of a moment of frustration where I did not line the question well. But in terms of uh, discussing how we deal with 9-11 and really the Afghanistan war, I think it needs to be said that Fundamentally, the American people did not respond to that that horrible event well at all in terms of not only the expansion of the security state, but also the way in which prejudice against uh, Muslim Americans have was weaponized to justify damn near any intrusion into the public life. 
Now, I, I'm, I know I'm a social democrat, a liberal, if you want to call, go further than that. But when it comes to the relationship between the power of the government and the citizens, there needs to be a, a reexamination of what power we expect our government to have in the first place and who they're making us afraid of in the first place. There was always the – like if you look at any action film from that point on, it was always – Muslim people in Afghanistan, Muslim people in Iraq, Muslim people in the United States even. The archetype of prejudice of like the this symbol was a powerful weapon and it was spawned from 9/11. So and I'm saying this with the benefit of hindsight. I'm 23 years old, so I didn't experience it like many of you did. But looking back, I remember growing up with Muslim students who had slurs used against them who had their hijab ripped from them and those who were told they're not real Muslims because they don't wear hijabs. Like there's things like that that I think really, really need to be hammered home because it wasn't just the bombing in Afghanistan. It wasn't the just the Iraq war. It was the security state and the pathology, pathology of prejudice within our system that we allowed to go unchecked and still remains a component of our security state and just the way we treat people in general. Totally agree. That's a really good point. And um, I saw that reflected as well. You know, I have Muslim friends. Uh, one of them was being surveilled by the FBI because of the work that they were doing in the Muslim religious community um, after 9-11. And um, when 9-11 happened, I was taking a calculus test, actually. I was a senior in high school, and I was going to the band room and just in time to see one of those huge box TVs, uh, the second tower come down on that. Um, and you know, it was, a, it was a huge shock, but I was very much in the same camp as BZ and I didn't know anything about politics at that time. I was very uneducated and ignorant about politics. Um, and so I really didn't get into it until after that. I'm gonna fast forward now to now <laughs> and the way that I kind of think about 9-11 um, and, and the Iraq war, I know a lot of veterans. I've met a lot of veterans and have communicated with a lot of veterans about their experiences because um, I, I just think it's so crappy how we treat our veterans who actually come back from war. As you mentioned, I'm glad you gave the statistics about how many of them commit suicide. Um, it, it, it got up to 22 a day at one point. It's come down a little bit since then. But yeah, like I, think, every day. I, I think that most people are pretty unaware about how bad of a problem that is and, um, and <laughs> how few resources a lot of veterans can access in order to deal with their PTSD. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I do want to actually put uh, something in perspective about what you just said is that I never lost anybody that I served with to enemy contact, but I know 38 people have committed suicide. Yeah. The, and I think, I think that that's a very common experience with veterans is that they know a lot of people, more people or oftentimes who have committed suicide than they know who, who they lost in, in active duty. Um, so, yeah, man, I mean, I, I think that for me, that's my kind of takeaway from all of it. I just saw, um humans young men a lot of them whose bodies were just fodder for whatever for whatever you know and and coming back battered and without limbs and mentally uh fucked up and i'm sorry and uh, we, we, we've already cursed man just just fire free it's a free fire okay. area you're good um but yeah and then and then they can't get help and then you know the police kill them or something so, or they kill themselves, or they end up in prison, or or um, deported. Uh, Trump deported a bunch of uh, veterans. Actually, we're supposed right. to get citizenship. Yeah, forgot about that. Um, I didn't. <laughs> they didn't. So I just um, that's kind of I, I want to do anything that I can personally and with my platform in order to raise awareness about the troubles of veterans and. Um, in terms of like 9-11 as an event or ending the Afghan war as an event, I mean, the war had needed to be ended. Obviously, it was going nowhere. Um, we knew that for a long time. Uh, we were wasting lives and, and other resources. So I think it was a good thing that it ended. I think that there was no way we were going to get out of there 
smoothly and that no matter what happened, no matter how we exit it, there was going to be um, severe consequences for Afghanistan after that. Um, so I'm glad that we did it and I'm glad that we got as many people out as we did. I think there's still people over there, right? Yeah. I don't think that we, go ahead. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I think it's especially in your wheelhouse to mention that because uh, I think it's a function of race and racism that we didn't get more of them out because people would serve as interpreters or work for Americans in various different capacities in Afghanistan uh, during the war. And they could not get visas to come over here because there was such extreme vetting and very low quotas to actually give people who worked with us visas to come to America. Um, I actually had a funny experience where one of my Uber drivers was an interpreter in RC East while I was over there. And he, we knew some of the same people, but thousands of people who worked for the Americans um, could not get visas because of strict, um, I don't want to say, I, I will say racist immigration uh, policies pushed by right-wingers in this country. Uh, and then they have the temerity to come out and uh, scream that we didn't get enough of our allies out. It, it's, it's They're angry at the ones that we have on various military bases now um, saying that they're going to bring crime. I've seen various right-wingers um, say that like the Afghans that we brought over can't be trusted. And I think that's a tragic um, stain on our honor. And it, it disgraces me uh, personally that we do that. And I'm sorry to have interrupted you with that. No, 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 it's fine. It's just an extension of them. They're not bringing their best argument. Right. And just like, yeah, exactly. So, um, or, or, or that they're cowards because they didn't fight harder against the Taliban when they had no motivation to. Yeah, to because I, I went a little off topic. Um, I'll just sort of summarize kind of my relationship to 9-11. We can move on. Um, so uh, I think I remember 9-11 happened. I was a junior in high school. Um, I remember walking into my science class and seeing it on the on the TV. And I remember thinking two things because uh, we didn't know who, who did it at this point. So, so I remember thinking oh man, our civil li liberties are gone. Like they are going to come down on, on that really hard. And I was 100% right. And then two, um, they're going to run out of planes <laughs> if they keep doing this. It's, it's inefficient. That was what my brain was thinking. But like... You had the Rick and Morty reaction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so like... Wub 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 dub dub. <laughs> um, so, you know... 9-11, I think, I was political before 9-11, but um, I think that in a way it laid the groundwork for me to be where I am now politically. Um, I wrote a short story that I sent to you um, that, that I'm still waiting for notes on, by the way. I got to um, do that. I'm so yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, it was called uh, Kirez, um, and it was set, it was based on a nightmare that I had had. And in this nightmare, um, I had imagined a, a platoon of soldiers in an Iraq, uh, Afghanistan kind of situation. Um, and their job was specifically to guard uh, what it was referred to as the big gun. And this was a, a machine. It was kind of like, uh, it looked like a howitzer in my, in my mind or some kind of rail gun or something. But the, the point of it was, was that their job was to guard a, a gun because the gun was so big and so powerful, it could only hit things so far away that no one could see them. And in a way, I realized after the writing it and after the dream that really what I was talking about in that short story is the state. And it, and it is the experience of having the state there after a collective trauma like 9-11, because what we learned on 9-11 was that having the, you know, biggest, most advanced, most powerful military in the world and filling our streets with police, it couldn't stop terrorism it absolutely could not and that this uh machine that we have been told from birth protects us and keeps us safe in fact is unable to actually do that function um and so that uh, eventually led to it the final thing that i'll say just really quickly is you it's very it's always difficult to control mountain folk that's always been a problem and afghanistan is where empires go to die <laughs> So <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that when you land, uh, I guess not now, but when you landed at Bagram Airfield in Afghanistan, um, the first sight you see when you get off your plane was the Soviet aircraft control tower that was built in like 1919 
uh, as like a prestige project. Uh, there's a British mud fort that was at the north end of the runway. And in the northeast corner, I believe, of that mountain bowl is one of Alexander's buried generals. <laughs> and when you yeah. see that and you hear that, you're like, what the hell am I doing here? Uh, I, I know we've been going for a while, but are you guys good to keep going to talk about COVID? Uh, I've, I've got maybe 10 more minutes and then I'm going to have to jet. Okay. I've got thank my own you. live stream to do. Okay, man. Thank, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, but real quick, what, you want to give your thoughts on COVID um, in 2021? Sure. Or, or a closing uh, statement either way. From how well, you guys saw my tweet. <laughs> I, I, I did. That was a good I one. You heard my tweet. Uh, yeah, like I, um, I've been very disappointed with the COVID response and, and how the media has treated COVID and how the CDC has treated COVID and how, um, especially at a time where people are having so much trouble discerning fantasy from reality, we need we needed we needed better guys. We needed better at this time for this emergency. And like Britton said, now we're we're approaching a million deaths. And it's just uh, for me, it's it's very sad. You know, I uh, I don't know. I don't think a lot of other people who haven't directly lost somebody who they know, similar to the uh, similar to the war, right? Um, maybe don't feel that, but I definitely feel it. Um, and I'm saddened by it. And on the other hand, I am grateful that the vaccine was able to finally get distributed and out there and available. Um, but we saw that by the time that really happened, there was, there was this whole movement against taking the vaccine. And I think that again, this big problem of ignorance and people easily convinced of uh, falsehoods. Um, it's that's it's gonna destroy us if we don't do something about it. We we have to um, focus on that problem, and I think the origin of that problem is actually education and the schools. And ultimately, um, I think that we'll see more problems that are exacerbated by ignorance, just like we saw with this. And I think that you'll also see that our country is less and less able to handle emergencies as a nation and um, in general. And so I worry about that. Um, I, I, but, you know, again, I'm grateful that we have this vaccine and, um, and that hopefully we can slow this down through more and more people getting it. I just got boosted today. So uh, I, hope you feel, I hope you feel good, man. Enjoy the enjoy the great five G connection. <laughs> yeah. No wait, hang on, I got a key here. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, but I know you have to go soon. But I did actually want to thank you for something. Uh, I, I mentioned it before we started, but I just wanted to say it on stream. When I was on your show, um, you actually stumped me about my position on confronting people about problematic racist attitudes that they might have who were close to me. And ever since, I'm gonna upload it because I just noticed it was in my render queue instead of actually uploading because I'm a boomer and I don't know how to push buttons. Uh, so I apologize guys. But um, uh, you, you actually stumped me in a way that made me reconsider my position uh, and made me think. So I wanted to actually thank you for that explicitly because you're doing really good work, man. Thank you so much, Bob. I appreciate that, man. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do. You know, I hope you guys will check out my content at the contraband wagon um, we're doing something that other people are not doing, which is we're not having debates, we're having conversations. And um, these conversations have been extremely valuable for everyone who's attended them, people who agree with me about race and people who don't agree with me about race. Um, so I would love for people to tune in and check it out. Bob, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be a part of this panel. I really enjoyed meeting you guys and talking with you and hearing your perspectives. And uh, I hope to see you again. Yeah, thanks a lot, thanks a lot man. You have a, you have a great day. All right, take care, y'all. Stay healthy. You too, man. Uh, so down to three. Uh, <laughs> uh, are you guys good to keep going on COVID? I know I don't want to take up too much y'all's time. I can go for another 30 minutes or so. Okay. Yeah. You're good I can go as long as you guys want to. I um, uh, I am fasting at the moment to get rid of COVID cookies. Uh, so I'm literally starving, but I've gotten to the point where I'm not hungry. So as long as I don't get pulled away for a bathroom break, we're good. <laughs> I made Bucatini. You could have some if you were in Florida. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I want to second what ContraPoint said and our uh, ContraBand back, <laughs> ContraBand said. ContraPoints is a completely different person who looks nothing like ContraBand. Too <laughs> um, so many ContraNames. Contra I, I, I hope he's laughing. <laughs> um, but uh, down, down, up, up, left, right, left, right, B, A, B, start. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Contra, a very good Contra code. Um, but yeah, we do have a problematic movement in this country. Uh, with vaccine misinformation. Uh, we had measles kind of return uh, over the last few years. Um, we had uh, prominent celebrities start endorsing anti-vax movements. And now we have like a political party that's um, politicized wearing masks and um, taking vaccines, which is just really problematic, especially during uh, a pandemic. And the other thing that it's contributed to is the further atomization of our society uh, because people have been isolated essentially for two years, unable to like go out and enjoy uh, the few remaining benefits of uh, American consumer society, um, which has produced like a very, um, I don't, malignant rage kind of in a lot of people, uh, especially down here uh, in the South. And I'm wondering if you guys' experiences were, were the same. Um, I'd actually like to jump in on that because I have, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the in the podcast, uh, been at uh, the throats of anti-vaxxers for quite some time, even before COVID was around. Um, Do it. I was, fundamentally, I have got to say the anti-vax movement is the product of scam artists and people who are willing to engage in what I like to call the exploitation of human cruelty. And by that, I mean they are perfectly willing to take the fact that a lot of parents are scared for the safety of their kids. They don't necessarily have to have a reason to be scared. They just want to protect their kids. That's intrinsic to them. But in many cases, when they're scared for their kids, they will ignore all the harm their decisions have on other people. And this is particularly true when it comes to measles, mumps, and rubella, the attack that occurred through Andrew Wakefield on that. Um when Andrew Wakefield falsified his study, and it is confirmed falsified, so he can sue me if he likes when I say that, uh, mm. falsified his study saying that vaccines cause autism, you had a lot of parents who were suddenly convinced that it was okay for their children to be uh, infected with measles as opposed to their kids being autistic. And that fundamentally reviews, reveals not only how these people were exploited through their fears, but the prejudice we have had towards disabled people. And I and it's disgusting, but it's also a problem that grew and has, in my opinion, if continued to affect the way we think about vaccines and the COVID response. You've probably heard this a thousand times. Well, all the people who are dying from COVID has co or have comorbidities. Well, a lot of people have comorbidities, just obesity being one of them, but also AFib and things like that. Things that people didn't like choose to have. There is a fundamental problem, not only with people exploiting people's fears but willing to throw away other people's lies to lives to justify those fears and so long as people like andrew wakefield and del bigtree are allowed a platform they will continue to spread it and it will kill people yeah i i, I have nothing to add to that because it's absolutely correct mm -hmm. i i have a little bit to add uh, nothing to take away because you're right that is absolutely correct um what i'll just simply say is this is another failure of capitalist societies. Um, you know, there is a lot of money involved in telling people what they already want to hear. Um, I have a friend uh, who is an anti-vaxxer and we've talked uh, at long, you know, and this is a guy who has had a lot of bad experiences with, um, you know, uh, the medical establishment. And, I, you know, if I had had the experiences he had had, I might have been a little more uh, skeptical uh, th than, I, than I was on this. Um, but in one hand, it's a it's a failure of our leaders because everybody in the country knows that they're not out for our benefit, that these institutions do not save us. And, you, you know, that they're, they're not interested in helping us. They are only interested in protecting the property of the elite. And even if you haven't read anarchist theory, even if you don't know anything at all about socialism, you know that the upper class are not our friends. And you don't, a lot of people don't want to admit that. So you do, you get this kind of false consciousness. But also, you know, like I said, there is a market for people to tell people what they want to hear. There are people that make their entire career, you know, on telling racist people, you're not racist and the problem is everyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the whole Jesse Lee Peterson thing that we talked about after my uh, debate with Hake. 
um, you know, because there's a market for that, because there's money to be made there. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, you know, eventually going from being a worker to being a sole proprietor of my own business, once you are doing something that brings money in, everything in your life gets better. Like when you find, I think Kurt Vonnegut called it like the, the money, um, like like the money stream in um, God bless you, Mr. Goldwater or something. I think that was the, was the book. Um, the thing is, is that when, when an activity that you are taking is economically incentivized, if that activity is antisocial, it doesn't matter. And it's going to push you in that way. And in a tragedy of the commons kind of situation, if there is someone who, you know, chooses not to go down that route, not to, you know, do the, the COVID denial, um, you know, or the vaccine skepticism or the anti-vax uh, or like the QAnon stuff. If they, if, they, if they say to themselves, I have integrity, I'm not going to do this. I guarantee you there's going to be someone else who will. As long as that market exists, there will be people going in there to exploit it. Because again, economically speaking, um, you know, capitalism requires infinite growth and it requires, and, and the economy itself must not only be making money for everybody constantly, but it has to be constantly expanding. If it ever doesn't expand, you get an economic crash. And, you know, we've seen what that's like because it happens every 10 years or so. And I would just like to additionally add, because I didn't bring it up, but I would also like to point out that fundamentally, we also have to be wary about how we respond to them. Like I wrote an article uh, when I was still at the uh, Lorian, uh, the college newspaper, when I was in my bachelor's, uh, basically advocating for the mandating of vaccines even before COVID was a thing. It was because of the MMR issue and measles. Mm -hmm. And I, I, at the time, I, I still stand by the article. I stand by the fact that vaccine mandates are constitutional, despite what people are going to be saying about the recent Supreme Court ruling. Um, but that also how you apply those mandates is important. Um, recently, there was a bill that was proposed in the Illinois state legislature that was going to make people who are not vaccinated that go to the hospital pay out of pocket for, uh, for their treatment. And I oppose it on the grounds that fundamentally this, this bill did not distinguish between people who do not have access to vaccination because of lack of transportation, which fundamentally affects African Americans more than white Americans like myself, uh, versus somebody who actively refuses. And one of the things that we need to be careful of is playing into the hands of anti-vaxxers who don't actually care about ending the inequality or inequity or the lack of access that African Americans and other minorities deal with in our country and use it as a way to say, hey, see the people who support vaccine mandates, the people who love vaccines, they are racist. There can be a discussion about the lack of access and distrust towards vaccines among groups of people without playing into anti-vaxxers. And I think people who support mandates like myself need to consider that whenever we deal with these kinds of uh, issues. Otherwise, we're just going to keep playing in the hands of these conspiracy theorists, and we're going to have a mutation that renders the vaccine that we currently have completely useless. I'd, I'd just like to add that it's absurd that the United States is GDP wise, the wealthiest country on the planet, and we don't have uh, public health care and that our health care system is so ineptly organized and so poorly run that it could not ad adequately respond to the shock of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not have enough hospital beds. We still don't have enough hospital beds because it wasn't profitable. Yeah. ICUs have... are currently 90, 100% across the country. We didn't have uh, stockpiles of ventilators or gear or PPE um, in the country because it's not profitable to do that. And this just demonstrates that certain things are better done as public services than they are as private industries. And healthcare um, is a primary one of, uh, one of those uh, industries. What I worry about going forward is that it's been two years and that we have a very short attention span and a very short amount of patience in this country. And I worry that we're just going to normalize um, one or two million people every year dying of COVID going forward because it feels like in the media coverage that we're seeing now, um, it's just normal. Uh, this, this is the new normal of just people dying in mass of COVID. Um, which is not something that we all want to live with. Uh, I'd like to go back to a bar and feel safe because I like drinking scotch in public um, <laughs> as opposed to just in private. But uh, it, it's not something that we can allow the media to normalize. And uh, 
learning this lesson about um, public health care and public stockpiles is something that we can't afford to let pass us by. Uh, this could be a whole stream just on our response to COVID, but this is a year in review and we've been going for two hours and I appreciate you guys' this time. So I'm going to segue us into um, some final statements. Um, what is your yeah. assessment of 2021 and what can we do positive to go forward? Unless, I'm sorry, Brent, you had something there. Yeah, there was just something I wanted to, to play off of at the end of that. Um, so first off, I think this one of the issues that we have here with the COVID response is, um, you know, the monkey sphere. Uh, human brains are only because we are evolutionarily designed to live in small groups and bands. Um, we cannot, even the smartest people cannot identify more than 150 individuals. And if you know, if you meet more than 150 people, like this happens like with rock stars, um, you will start to forget people that you remembered because there's just not enough space in that brain to remember more people than that. So it's 100 to 150 people. Everyone else gets grouped into this uh, abstracted other. It's why, you know, you've, you can say stuff like, you know, the death of one man is a tragedy. The death of a million is merely a statistic. Our brains cannot handle that size of a number in any realistic way. Just like we can't really conceive of how exactly how much wealth a billionaire has. Um, so I think that's one of the big problems. The other big problem, uh, I think, with regard to, um, you know, what you so the failed right and, and I love that you use that term. I use it every, every time now because I think it, it perfectly illustrates what they are and what they've done. Um, there is this attitude that they have, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying about uh, Vietnam and about um, now Afghanistan, the idea that they were hamstrung. That, that the nation has all of this great power, but is being hamstrung by by some sort of destructive force within it. Um, you know, and heck, I mean, that was the literal Nazi conspiracy theory about why Germany had lost uh, World War One, that they were hamstrung by Jews. Um, there is this perception, um, and I think it's a false consciousness that arises from the inherent contradiction of the interests of the powerful within your supposedly democratic society being represented far more than the interests of the majority and the interests of the people. And so what, what you have happened with that is you get this idea on the right. And, you know, when I was younger, I was on the right where it's like, we have all of this great power, but we cannot use it because people will think that's rude. You know, and so Donald Trump comes in and says, I'm going to make America great again. What he was communicating to people was the gloves are coming off. I am going to give you the um, uh, the uh, prosperity and power and respect that has been denied to you because the, we, we have to play nice with all of the other people on the planet. And you you saw what happened You because that it doesn't actually work. We don't have the ability to do what the right thinks that we have to do. The gloves have already come off and the foot has been on the gas pedal of our economy and it's already pushed to the floor for decades. It never leaves that position. So when that happens, you, the false consciousness needs another way um, to guide the problem away from what it actually is, the, the diagnosis. And so you get the conspiracy, you get the Jews, you know, control, I don't know, whatever crazy conspiracy that they happen to have. I'm not going to say it on, yeah. I'm not gonna Please say don't. It. It'll get I, had, I, I had somebody when I was um, like eight uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, tell me one of those conspiracies about Disney. Mm -hmm. I was going uh, to Disney World, and I was like, "Who are the Jews?" <laughs> <laughs> That's well, well done. Like, um, yeah, I, I didn't so know. I legitimately didn't. The the point is, is that like a, a famous quote is, is that uh, anti-Semitism is socialism for fools, and furthermore, QAnon. Um, you know, that's socialism for fools. The, it's the false consciousness that cannot be pointed by either mainstream party at the actual people screwing us, which is the wealthy, the powerful, the elite. And instead, it gets, it gets moved on to scapegoats and imaginary conspiracies. And thus, instead of someone realizing, oh, you know what, um, you, you know, Jeff Bezos 
is abusing people across the nation so that he can take a pleasure trip to space where I can't even feed my kid, you know, it must be a conspiracy. They, 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 they latch onto this. And of course, the people at the top have every incentive to pay people like Tucker Carlson, like Ben Shapiro, the billionaires paying millionaires to tell, um, uh, to tell, you know, the average person that it, it's the, the, that the fault is not theirs, but in fact is either, you know, the enemy political party or a, um, you know, internal conspiracy or some sort of outsider. Um, it's absolutely disgusting and unconscionable, but unfortunately it, it's very persuasive because these people control virtually all the news and information that we are ever granted access to. Connor, did you have anything? Because I've got a closing statement kind of uh, after after that. Um, I will just keep this brief since I already went on one rant today. Um, <laughs> rant away, it, man. Go ahead. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to the way in which we talk about people and power, I think fundamentally you've got to convince people that the government and the people in institutions of power have the burden of proof on them whenever they make a proposal, not the other way around. You don't have to be an expert to ask a question. You don't have to have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD in political science or a bachelor's in history like me. You don't have to write 55 pages of things to understand that, hey, I can't feed my kid or something along those lines or, hey – the IEP doesn't apply to the private school and there's the public school is getting half the funding that it needs. You have a right to demand answers from your politicians. If it means going into a Zoom meeting for your city council uh, session and saying, hey, I'm on the segment. I like to know why the heck my emails haven't come back for the 13,000th time. Or, hey, representative so-and-so, I sent you this email. This was your response and I'm going to read it in front of everybody. Don't be afraid to be a little rude to people in power because they're there because you allow them to be. And if you want to, and if you really want to replace them, take their seat for yourself if you have to. That's a that's a great statement, man. Hell yeah, um, comrade. <laughs> what what I what I, what I wanted to point out is that uh, I, we didn't cover the space billionaires, and I'm kicking myself now, but. Uh, I will say this real quick that it was actually a very positive thing for me that everybody was really upset about the space billionaires going to going uh, on pleasure cruises into orbit on the backs of uh, thousands of underpaid workers. So that was a that was a positive thing. In the end, I think 2021 was a year that showed us that uh, we on the left are still in the planting phase or in the sowing phase of uh, building a movement, and that 2022. Uh, should be the year that we do that. I think it also showed us that the soil is ripe in this country for us to actually sow our ideas. Whether you be like a sock dem like me and Connor, who are the filthy statists, so now outnumber you, Breton. So you're going down, old man. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> play with you, brother. But uh, uh, Nobody uh, likes a fence sitter. <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, uh, Try living with three Republicans and call me a fence sitter again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. we'll sit you on a fence <laughs> but um i'm kidding man uh you see gangs in new york um uh, never mind uh, <laughs> but uh but the 2021 also showed us that the soil is ripe for us to actually sow our ideas and that this country is crying out for change and that we can't allow the alternative to left ideology which is the failed right wing um, which is a term that Brenton has to pay me five cents every time he uses uh, to to take hold because they are not a valid solution to our problems. It's an escrow. It's an oh, great. <laughs> I kind of write it off on my taxes, but um, but it, it, the soil is ripe for us to actually uh, plant our ideas. And when we plant our ideas and we let them come to fruition, we make great progress. Uh, if you look at 1900 or 1921 to 2021, we didn't have social security, Medicare, highway systems. Um, or any kind of alternative to um, just brutal capitalism. In that 100 years, we've made progress. We can continue to make progress, and we will continue to make progress because the alternative is barbarism. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's my conclusion for uh, 2021. And for 2022, uh, we have to keep moving forward and keep fighting the good fight, uh, even though it's discouraging sometimes, even though you get burnt out sometimes. Take some time for yourself if you have to, but then get back into the fight because this is not something that we can afford to lose. 
um, not only for ourselves, but for future generations and for uh, the great um, march of history moving forward. And yes, I actually did just get to say the great march of history moving forward. And no, I don't regret it. <laughs> yes, I am a jerk. <laughs> um, so I will say sort of on, on this note, um, on the march of history note, um, I, I'm not entirely convinced that progress exists or that it's a thing. I think... It, I think it's a result of power within the society. The idea that if we had, um, I guess, been conquered by a nation of bird worshipers, the people who were born into that nation would look at their history and then at um, where they were now. And they say, look at all the progress we've made. We are worshiping so many more birds than there used to be. <laughs> so, you know, in, in a way, I, I think that because it is difficult, you can't be anywhere without a point to judge yourself from. And since every point is I in the center, the, the question then becomes like, it, is the world getting better from your perspective or is it getting worse from your perspective? Um, so, so I'm going to, I'm going to be uh, horrible about that as far as the last year uh, and, and what I hope to have accomplished. Um, I think that January 6th was a major wake up call and is being at least paid attention to by the powers that be. Is their response to it ad adequate? Absolutely not. Not when 100% of the politically motivated violence, um, you know, was in, uh, you know, uh, in 2018 was due to the far right. But after these multiple mass shootings, um, after the, uh, you know, the summer of a kind of chaos before Donald Trump um, and where things are going right now, um, law enforcement is in a way beginning to respond. Will it be adequate? Probably not. But the, I said this when uh, I was watching the, um, uh, the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. And in a lot of ways, I saw that trial as a referendum on whether the ruling class believed that the bigger threat was left-wing activists engaging in property destruction or right-wing uh, vigilantes and, um, you know, uh, and vigilante is the nice way of saying it. The other way of saying it is terrorist. Um, and, you know, ultimately, it seems like that time it came down on the side of, um, we would really rather, um, you know, uh, white people continue to shoot and kill uh, brown people and leftists who happen to be in our streets. And that's probably the worst outcome that we could have on a on a macro level, ignoring the, the actual case itself. So I think that as we move forward, it seems that the country has slowly learned some lessons, but also the forces of reaction are still gathering. And again, as the country um, loses its, as the ruling class loses its um, faith in capitalism as a method to maintain their rule and to maintain their privileges, they have recourse to fascism. And uh, hopefully we do not see history repeat itself because as capitalism melts down around us and, um, you know, it's going to be replaced either by, um, either by class. So as socialism either, or barbarism. Yeah, yes, exactly. Socialism, or it's going to be replaced with race and nationality. And then you get fascism. Both combatants know what's in store for the loser. I hope that this time we, we choose humanity and we choose socialism. Oh, hey, oh, he's here. I was in. listening. I, I did my my call. Went very well. I have a I have a line to connect with the Marshall Project, which is very exciting. Um, so, uh, but I want to say uh, the 2020 for doing the like, what do we do 2022? I'm bring it back to the the local thing and what dovetail with what Brent was saying. You know, things are we are moving towards you know barbarism and the collapse. And uh, if you're uh, someone who's listened to the podcast, it could happen here, then you know what is going to save you is not a stockpile of weapons. It will be life skills and community. And if you want to find the community of like-minded people in your town right now, know who they are. They know you. Probably a good thing to do in case stuff's falling apart, but also probably thing to do to keep things from falling apart. 
So that's a good one. Connor, did you get your closing statement in? I think you did, right? I, I gave a general statement, but I'd just like to add one final thing, and then uh, we can uh, get on, move on on this. Um, I, I would just like to remind people, particularly my age, that your influence, your ability to create change has always been there. You just have to find a starting point from which you want to base your activism, um, whether that's electoral politics, direct action, or just getting involved in your local uh, politics and helping people out, or just informing people like BZ over here. Fundamentally, what you want to do, what you want to fix is up to you. And no matter how much somebody on the TV or somebody like myself wants to tell you what you should do, you need to look at your personal conditions and the conditions of you, the people around you and wonder what matters to you. Do you want to continue to live in a world where your concerns are muddied, flooded with nonsense and, and unanswered? Or do you want to actually act and find something that you care about that can actually make change? And, and to be the lib in the room, uh, I was thinking to my younger generation friends, please vote. <laughs> please vote. Oh, I'm please not against vote. voting. But oh, I, I know. Say, I know. It, it's yeah, a debate. If anyone, anyone is like, where do I start or anything? I cannot tell you one of the best things you could do. Like if you're like, I don't know what to do or go to my meeting. Just go watch your uh, city council meetings. P particularly, you can skip all the, you know, go to the live streams of them. And I say this as someone who had to research and watch like, like watch city council meetings. Like I found a Netflix series with seven seasons. I needed to binge. And, uh, but I, I was luckily able to scrub through them and just go and listen to what people bring to your public comment, you know, find the time once a week to do that. Whereas you, like you said, maybe you, who, I don't care who you listen to. If you're a destiny fan, if you're a Vouch fan, if you're a Tucker Carlson fan, turn them off one night a week Go watch your city council archives and listen to your neighbors. That's my advice. And yep. touch grass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, before you, Brent, the only people who ever used that phrase to me, actually, were Chantel Brown supporters who thought that I was being ridiculous and how I was like meticulously covering the lies in her stump speech. Like <laughs> really? do you realize the only reason I have this story is because I went out, I touched grass and I watched her and then I scrutinized what she said. Yep. <sighs> but before I mean, literally go touch and those grass, some bury, lids, bury, some bury your I head knew. in your yawn, but, but, in your lawn. It, 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 I believe it's been uh, hashtag not medical advice, but I believe it's been uh, proven that that um, being in nature uh, actually makes us happier. Like just, just breathing that be stuff be in. Yeah. Before 2016, the only people that told me to touch grass were filthy hippies trying to sell me um, <laughs> supplements. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming on here. I know Contraband's not here, but I want to thank uh, Progressive American. I want to thank BZ Douglas and Brenton Langle. Um, Y'all are friends of the show. Uh, if you come on the Mustache Mafia show enough, we do a making ceremony where um, you take an oath, you prick your finger, and you burn a picture of Ronald Reagan. It's great. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm down. Yeah. Uh, I want to conclude, though, uh, by saying that, yeah, uh, we are still in the sewing phase, that uh, going forward um, in 2022, it's not going to be any easier than 2021 was. But, uh, again, it, it's a fight that we can't afford to lose. Um, and the advice that you get on shows like this uh, that are trying to get you actually out into the world – um, to do things and to make the world a better place uh, is always superior to the sad, angry uh, right wing or the artificial products that are produced by mass media. And I want to thank everybody for listening to this. I know it's been like two and a half hours and Connor got here like super early. So I'm going to thank him so much for his time. Uh, thank you, BZ. And thank you, Brenton, for coming on. Thank you again, Contraband. Um, this has been a, a very long edition of the Mustache Mafia podcast, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, and we're going to, we're going to end on that note. Thank you everybody. And good night. Night. Thanks again for watching. I really enjoyed this panel. It was the first one that I had really been on where there was a back and forth discussion around not only a set of singular issues that we thought were important, but a variety of approaches that were distinct from one another and wasn't just going after conservatives or going into specific fights on online drama. So this was a nice change of pace. Bob and I are discussing the possibility of doing another stream with me talking about the 1776 Commission 
alongside other possible guests, but at the moment that's still up in the air. Still, you should check out his work as well as his Twitter to get further updates and to see if you'll see me on there. Thanks again for watching and I hope you have a wonderful day.